coming up first, we have Hyun Min Lee from Seoul National University presenting Guaranteeing the Integrity of DNS Records Using PKIX Certificates. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Hyun Min Lee. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Seoul National University. And currently, I'm working with Professor Taehyung Kwon. So today, I'm going to present our current work about guaranteeing the integrity of DNS records using CA issued PKIX certificates. And let's start. As you know, DNS is used to map domain names and their resources like AL records or MX records. And whether you know about it or not, most of your internet activities require the DNS lookup process. However, also as you know, the initial design of DNS does not consider any security features. So there is no authentication and, and there is no integrity checks. So it is known that DNS is vulnerable to attacks like DNS cache poison. As a solution, DNSSEC was introduced. With DNSSEC, the integrity of DNS records can be verified. It has been 20 years after DNSSEC was introduced. Now, about 91% of top level domains deployed DNSSEC. Oh, such a very good deployment rate. Then what about second level domain? Unfortunately, their deployment rate is quite low. For example, in 2017, less than 1% of .com, .net, and .org domains deployed DNSSEC. The rate was slightly increased in December 2020s. Between 3 and 5% of domains in these three TLDs are assigned, which means that they deployed DNSSEC. This result shows an important fact. DNSSEC is a very good mechanism for DNS security but its deployment rate is too low. In other words, the vast majority of DNS messages in the real world are still not protected. Also, deploying DNSSEC is quite complex. To deploy DNSSEC, a domain owner has to publish and manage three new DNS records, DNS key, RRC, and DS records. Especially, to support DNSSEC correctly, a domain owner has to upload DS records to its parent zone. Usually, this process requires the cooperation of registrars. For example, the domain owner manually contacts its registrar and requests to add a DS record to its parent zone. This step is necessary to form a DNSSEC chain. If there is no DS record, then a domain cannot be protected because the DNSSEC chain is not established. However, many domains miss this essential step. Uh, it is known that about 30% of signed domains do not upload DS records, even though they have DNS key records. Uh, these records do not mean that DNSSEC is poorly designed. But the fact is that DNSSEC deployment is low, and even high portion of domains that deploy DNSSEC are incorrectly using. So with this motivation, we try to find a way that guarantees the integrity of DNS messages without such dependencies to other DNS entities. For a practical and deployable way, we consider two requirements. First, the new way should minimally require a change or cooperation of other entities in the DNS infrastructure. For example, it should not require the cooperation of parent zones or registers. And next, we need a mechanism that maximally use the current DNS infrastructure for easier deployment. Here, we focus on that most domains already use public keys for HTTPS or TLS. According to the Google Transparency Report, most web traffic to Google is encrypted using HTTPS. The portion is about 94% in the last month. And the certificates used by these domains are usually issued by public sheets. For instance, Batch Encrypt is one of the biggest CA that whole certificate issuance process is automated and well established. Thus, users can be issued certificates easily and let's increase issues more than 2 million certificates per day. So in this context, we thought that you can leverage those certificates that successfully deployed by domains. Let's see the concept of our design. As you know, in DNSSEC, DS records needs to be unloaded to its upper zone to form a DNSSEC chain. And DNSSEC chain guarantees that the public key belongs to the zone and signature of other set is generated using the corresponding private key. In contrast, in our design, each domain or zone has a certificate and use a public key to generate a signature of DNS records. Here, 
The signature guarantees the entity to obtain its records, and the certificate guarantees that the signature is generated by the domain owner. And finally, the certificate can be validated by verifying the certificate chain. So in this way, each zone or domains do not require cooperation of other zones to deploy our design. And next, let's delve into more details regarding how domains can deploy our design and how clients can verify the integrity of Guinness records. To deploy our design, first, a domain obtains a certificate from CAs. Here, the domain also gets public and private key pair. Next, the domain generates a signature of Guinness record using its private key. And then the domain publishes the generated signature as the RRC record. Finally, the domain uploads its public key as a DNS key record and a certificate chain as a search record. So as you can see, we suggest to use three DNS record types, RRC, DNS key, and search record. And if a client wants to fetch a DNS record and verify its integrity, it first fetches the target DNS record, for example, a record and its signature, here RRC record. Next, the client fetches the, its public key, here DNS key records, and the certificate chain, here search records. The client can check the validity of the public key through the certificate chain verification. And finally, checks the integrity of DNS records by verifying the signature of it. So in this way, we can guarantee the integrity of DNS records. So in the previous slide, we said two requirements about practicality and deployability. Let's see how our design satisfies these requirements. First, our design should minimally require a change or cooperation of other genes and kids in its operation. So for example, it does not require cooperation of parent genes. For this purpose, we exploit PKI certificates, which are successfully deployed by many domains. As you saw before, a certificate can be verified through the certificate chain verification, and this does not need cooperation from parent jobs. Thus, only little modification is required for name servers and local reservoirs to adopt our design, like processing a search record or verifying a certificate chain. Next requirement is the maximum reuse of the current DNS infrastructure. For this, we suggest using three existing record types, as I mentioned before, DNS key, RSIC, and search records. First, DNS key is used to store a public key. The below figure shows the fields in the DNS key record. Among them, two bits in the flex fields are used now. If bit seven is set to one, it means that the DNS key record holds the key for DNS jones. And if bit 15 is set to one, it means that the record contains key sign key. Otherwise, it contains jones sign key. And other bits are reserved for future use. So, we can exploit these reserved bits to specify our uses. For example, to define our uses, we can set bit 4 to 1 and bit 15 to 0. If a client reads this flag, then it should verify a certificate chain and handle the messages according to our design. And next, we use RRC record to store signatures of DNS RRCs. And finally, search record stores a certificate chain. In this way, we can reuse the current DNS infrastructure without the need for new DNS records. Uh, as I mentioned before, we do not criticize or blame DNS. We want to find an easier way for domain owners to protect their DNS messages. In this context, uh, our mechanism can coexist with DNS. For example, a domain wants to deploy DNS, but its support drone does not support DNS. Then, in this case, the domain can use our mechanism because it does not require upper joint cooperation in its deployment. So uh, in this presentation, I introduced our ongoing research. Most DNS messages in the real world are still vulnerable. So we propose an easier and deployable way that guarantees the integrity of DNS messages. Okay, thank you. I'm, and I'm happy to take any questions. First question, uh, the question is about have I looked in and which CA should reserve our trust and how do you ensure they are, are using the same list where PK is centralized but everyone has its own trust store? Yeah, uh, we also think about it because of many, uh, many okay, like I said, entities use the different list. So uh, we think about we can integrate the 
list of trusted sheets so uh, we can make the kind of uh, same pictures about this. So uh, the next question is about uh, the web PK has no name constraints and shape from no controls which domains clients have to trust our shares and there is the human operator to place okay when a share is untrusted. Uh, CH connector is personal current direction when it's to remain valid. This scheme is trivially downgradable without parents test the attacker can just pretend the domain is unsigned. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, we, but uh, our main focus is uh, because TenSec is not widely deployed, so we want to make a more easy and deployable way for domain owners. Because currently, a domain owner, if a domain owner wants to protect their DNS using TenSec, but if their parent joins or registrar does not support TenSec, then there is no way to guarantee protect their DNS. So. Uh, we want to suggest one more options for domain owners to protect their domains. In this sense, I think uh, we, our mechanism can coexist with DNSSEC and help the DNS security. Question, how much of this has been implemented? Uh, actually, uh, we implemented for a, a small test bed. So uh, we, we test the overhead of like transmission overhead or delays, but it a little, Little bit increased compared to original TNS and have has uh, less delay compared to TNS then in the view of delays or transmission data size. Uh, for the next question, you for TNS tech data, uh, we also referenced there in 2020s, not only 2017s data, like here, uh, the second data we got from this DNSSEC data set. And this data set shows that about less than 5% of the computer network that are the domains deploy DNSSEC. Right, I think that's the last question we have time for. Um, so I'd like to take a moment to thank Hyun Min Lee for that talk. Um, the next speaker is Otto Morabek. And their talk is entitled Aggressive cache RFC 8198 effectiveness, the NSEC 3 case. Okay, thank you. So, my name is Otto Moorbeek. I'm with Open Exchange and PowerNest, mainly working on the recursion. I'm going to talk about aggressive caching effectiveness, uh, specifically about the NSEC 3 case. Uh, in this talk, I will uh, shortly address what aggressive caching is, then uh, talk about what cost, uh, uh, what uh, event cost is uh, to, uh, to do my research in this little research. The main question is, is aggressive caching effective? And it turns out that there is a quite a large difference between N the NSEC case and the NSEC 3 case. I'll illustrate that with some graphs and some statistical analysis. And that will lead to a conclusion about the whole uh, effectiveness of NSEC 3 uh, aggressive caching. So uh, aggressive caching is a, a, a form of negative caching uh, employed by recursive resolvers. Uh, normal negative caching is uh, limited in scope in the sense that in most cases you'll, you have to have seen a name, uh, a specific name type combination before, before uh, to uh, make sure that the negative caching is uh, uh, working. So, uh, there are some extensions to this idea because you can uh, uh, extend it to uh, all types uh, of a certain name or uh, all names below a certain point in the uh, DNS tree, so to speak, uh, with uh, uh, the reasoning in RFC 8020, but uh, the scope is quite limited. For NSEC 3 and uh, NSEC and NSEC 3 graph caching, uh, we have a different. Uh, approach because a single record can deny a pretty large subset of all names of, of, of name of all possible names. So if you have that specific NSEC or NSEC tree record in the cache, in aggressive cache, you can first see if a name that is being queried matches the, the, the NSEC or NSEC tree record. And if so, you can 
synthesize a reply to, to the client without uh, consulting an uh, uh, authoritative server and also without ever having uh, had to answer that specific query before. There's a bit more to it. Uh, all details are described in RFC 8198. Uh, and, uh, uh, but the basic mechanism is if you have a specific, an NSX or NSX tree record deni that denies a name, you can use it to uh, uh, synthesize an answer without consulting authoritative servers. Um, NSEC uh, aggressive caching is uh, uh, implemented by all major resolvers, uh, or at least open source resolvers as far as I know, it's unbound and bind to it for NSEC only. Not resolver and Pioneer's recursor do it for NSEC tree as well. Um, one thing to take note of is if you have NSEC tree zone with, op with opt-out, using opt-out, then it does not allow for aggressive caching. Uh, so in that case, uh, you the aggressive cache won't help you from the recursor uh, point of view. And uh, so that will still incur a load authoritative server because it has to uh, query uh, uh, old names. So the, the event that caused uh, to do my little research on this is, is a in no, happened in November 20, uh, 2022 and a large shown specifically .nl switched to uh, a different NSEC uh, tree settings. Uh, and .nl has uh, more than 6 million names uh, and more than 60% are the next SEC assigned. So that's a bit a different number than we saw in the, pre uh, the numbers we saw in the previous presentation. Um, originally, uh, the .nl zone was uh, already using NSEC tree, but with opt-out and they switched to uh, NSEC tree with without opt-out, so not using opt-out anymore. And they also uh, changed the salt uh, settings and the iteration count to uh, comply with uh, recent uh, recommendations. So that's a very good thing. And um, well, opt-out was switched off. So there is a potential opportunity for aggressive caching in the case. And um, so what you would see from a authoritative server operator point of view is that the number of is resulting in X domain would drop, should drop, because in many cases, uh, resolvers are be going to be able to decide that a certain name does not exist or a certain name type combination does not exist without consulting an authoritative server, the whole point of aggressive caching. So after they switched, they, uh, we're looking at the metrics and did not see any drop in uh, number of queries resulting in NX domain uh, results. So out of curiosity, uh, this prompted a little investigation by myself. Uh, so because other people were, was, were wondering what's going on here. And well, first we have to establish that uh, there is an opportunity for aggressive uh, caching, but uh, our uh, recursors uh, in the Netherlands, which are the major users of the .NL zone, uh, actually running with NSEC3 aggressive caching enabled. And we know at least a few operators that actually do have that enabled and are running. Uh, uh, so um, 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 at least a small drop of uh, 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 queries resulting in NSEC3 would have been effect, uh, expected if NF, NSX tree caching was uh, effective. So then, then turned around to our own software because uh, we, uh, that's the easiest. And uh, I first did a very simple test, a uh, manual test, and those uh, showed that uh, we at least have the NSX tree aggressive cases uh, covered in our CI. So the actual mechanism is working in our recursor. It's also enabled by default. If you have, uh, so there's uh, plenty of opportunity there. Uh, then I did a few tests with NSEC zones and there's a quick success, even with pretty large zone like .se, which is used as NSEC, uh, hitting the aggressive cache uh, wasn't uh, uh, difficult at all. For NSEC tree, no such luck. I uh, uh, was using the .nl zone and other large, uh, uh, and other large uh, uh, NSEC tree zones, and I was not able to hit the NSEC tree aggressive cache until 
I started testing with a pretty small zone. And um, so that uh, triggered my curiosity even more. And uh, I started uh, some more thorough uh, systematic uh, investigation, assuming it, uh, where I was not looking at a bug, but at, at the property specific properties of NTAC3 uh, aggressive uh, caching. So the test setup. Uh, basically, I uh, used uh, random names, uh, so uh, a typical random, uh, uh, random subdomain attack, uh, generated uh, uh, random strings with various patterns in a file. We used that for uh, both the NSEC3 case and NSEC3, NSEC and NSEC3 cases. Uh, started with a clean cache, read a name from a file, record aggressive, uh, record aggressive cache statistics, and then graph them. Um, we'll see those uh, graphs uh, later. And uh, a few things to note is that the aggressive cache gets filled during the test. So the first few queries never will get a hit uh, because uh, the caches are not filled yet. Um, also, PyWitness recursor uses a, a separate aggressive cache data structure. Uh, I could imagine that you will be able to reuse the current existing cache to also find your aggressive aggressive cache uh, information but due to the way the aggressive cache is queried where you are looking for to see if a name fits in a range uh, we thought that a separate aggressive cache is uh, data structure is better suited for that um, but i'm sure uh, if you are smart enough then you could probably fit it into an existing cache uh, data structure as well but we have a separate cache, so it's easy to uh, count the aggressive cache uh, entries. Um, one thing to note is the name of the metric is called aggressive NSEC cache entries, but it counts both the NSEC and NSEC entries. And uh, we used four, or I used four test zones, uh, two small zones, one NSEC3 and one NSEC3, uh, both. Uh, uh, small in the sense, uh, let's say a dozen names or so, maybe two dozen, uh, really small. And then uh, somewhat bigger zones, the dot CZ zone, CZ zone, which is NSEC3 with no opt-out, and the dot NU uh, zone, which is NSEC. Uh, both are somewhat similar in size, uh, somewhere between 1 million and 2 million names. So, the first test, small zones. What we see on the left-hand side is NSEC3 results and right-hand side NSEC results. The green lines are the uh, number of uh, hits uh, recorded, and the blue lines are the number of entries in the cache. So the left-hand side is querying a random alpha string uh, name, random alpha number X name dot uh, small NSEC3 zone. And what you see there is that, uh, well, the uh, uh, number of entries in the cache is after a few iterations of the test uh, constant. Uh, it contains a few entries and almost all queries will cause a hit in the aggressive cache. On the right hand side, we see a very similar pattern. Uh, so here, the, K, the case between NSEC3 and NSEC is, is, is not much different. And that uh, also agrees with my manual uh, little experiment where I was creating small zones. Now let's take a look at the, uh, 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 two, the two larger zones, which are is the ZZ zone and the NU zone. Um, here we see uh, also a linear growth on the left-hand side for the NSEC3 case, but the linear growth is now the number of NSEC, NSEC3 cache entries. So that grows to uh, about a thousand uh, after uh, a thousand queries. And the number of hits stays at zero. So that means that after our test run of thousand names to random alpha.zz, uh, we effectively saw no hits and a completely uh, or uh, and a thousand uh, NSEC3 uh, uh, entries in the aggressive cache. On the same test for the .nu uh, uh, zone, we see a growing number of hits and a growing number of cache entries, but 
there's a small tendency to uh, uh, to flatten out for the cash growth and uh, a nice uh, increase in uh, steeper uh, for the number of hits. So in the end of the test of the thousand queries, about 200 queries were answered from the aggressive cash. And we have about, let's say, 800 entries in the aggressive uh, answer cache. So that's, uh, but the main point is, is that the answer tree aggressive cache is basically not working. Thousand, another test, but now using a common prefix. So I uh, pref prefix the random name with uh, uh, triple uh, A. We, on the left hand side, we see the same, exactly the same pattern and NSAC tree case is not actually uh, causing any hits, but the cache gets filled. Uh, and on the right hand side, you see that the cache is very effective. Very few entries in the, in the entry in the cache, but a lot of hits. So that is good for the NSAC case, but NSAC tree case is still not uh, doing as anything substantial. Uh, Variation, not uh, alphanumeric names, but random binary names. So the full label namespace uh, labels can, of course, be uh, binary values uh, outside the uh, ordinary uh, alphanumeric uh, cases. And there we see on the left hand side the exact same pattern, no hits, but a uh, filled cache. And on the right hand side, we do see effective caching, uh, a bit different than the uh, alphanumeric uh, case, but uh, uh, still effective. And the last graph, which is showing uh, the same case as the second graph, set of graphs, but now with uh, 10,000 random alphanumeric names. There on the left hand side, you see a completely different pattern. The first part is, is the same, but at some point in time, the TTLs of the stored NSEC three uh, records uh, is uh, being hit. Uh, so, uh, so, or the TTL elapsed because the, I, actually I was uh, being uh, rate limited by the CZ name server. So uh, the test wasn't running very fast. So, uh, ex uh, and uh, 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 so the, while the test was running, the NSEC three uh, records in the cache were uh, expiring. Uh, so I ended up with not as much uh, records in the cache, uh, but still only a few hits there. There we see a few hits, uh, but only after uh, many, many, many uh, uh, records were inserted into the cache. On the right hand side, you see uh, somewhat expected. There I did. I was, there was no rate lim limiting going on, and also the TTL is a bit longer, so uh, a growing uh, number of hits and uh, uh, gradually flattening a number. Uh, rise in the number of uh, entries in the cache. So some intermediate uh, 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 conclusion is, is that the NSAC results are very much as expected and in line with earlier presentations done here, uh, for example, OARC 28, where Peter Spacek uh, talked about the uh, NSAC uh, uh, efficiency, NSAC uh, aggressive cache uh, uh, efficiency and uh, I think my results uh, are for the NSEC case are in line with that, uh, those results. So uh, let's take a look and compare the NSEC cheat case to the NSEC case to see what, what are the differences. So first, what's actually uh, in the cache? So uh, um, after uh, the 10K run, we see uh, entries in the cache, which uh, deny uh, subsets of the complete namespace uh, uh, possible. Uh, um, each of the NSEC records here deny a, 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 a certain part of the, the tree, and um, that is basically the same for the NSEC tree case, except that not the actual names are uh, denied, but hashes of those names. And that's a major difference uh, we uh, will see. Um, if a hash, a certain range of hash is denied, it doesn't mean that the uh, names uh, follow any pattern. Uh, that is the basic uh, difference. And for the NSEC, the pattern is there. It's the canonically ordered uh, names that are denied, a range of those names. But for the NSEC tree case, 
The names are scattered all over the place. The names that result in the uh, in the hashes being denied. So each NSEC tree uh, record denies a subset of all possible names. For the NSEC case, that subset is a contiguous canonically ordered subset. Uh, that means, if you think about it, that uh, very few NSEC records can deny many or even all names that the registry does not allow. For uh, if you're talking about uh, uh, naming conventions, things like the names that the registry does allow. Also, typos are close in a canonically ordered way. So one typo is probably covered by, uh, uh, sorry, a NSEC record covering one typo is probably also covering other typos of the same nature. Exactly uh, uh, the same uh, reasoning you can follow for uh, things like a appending a, a name, or, 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 sorry, appending a letter to a name or things like that. Um, they cluster all uh, together and are likely covered by the, either the same NSEC record or uh, one that is also covering similar typos. For NSEC tree, oh, the case is different. The NSEC tree record denies a set of all possible names, uh, a subset of all possible names, but that, that uh, actual labels denied by a range of NSEC tree hashes is scattered all over the name space. So let's take a look at the size of those uh, subsets. Uh, this is a rough uh, uh, estimate, uh, uh, no, not a very thorough analysis, but you get the idea, I hope. Um, the SHA-1 has a length of 160 bits, and so it is normally encoded as 32 uh, characters, five bits per character. Um, in the previous, one of the previous slides I showed, the uh, snapshots of the caches, and then, then, we, then we, there we saw that, uh, let's say, between three and four characters were uh, shared between the owner and the next. So the range uh, 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 of the common set that the common prefix of those uh, of the range was about four characters. Um, if an NSEC tree range as a uh, pref common prefix length of four, that means that 20 bits are fixed. Uh, of the 100, so that remains that 130, 130 bits can free, 160, the total number of bits in a SHA-1, uh, 20 bits are fixed, so 130, 130 bits can vary. Uh, two to the power 130 is pretty large, it's a huge large number. But even if we deny that many names with a single NSEC uh, uh, record, it still means that we only cover about 1 billion of possible hashes. Somewhat more, because what to the power 20 is a bit bigger than 1 million, but that's the ballpark figure. Suppose you have uh, 3,500 of such NSEC records cached, then the results in about what still only about one in 300 chance that we will that a random name that the hash of, of a name which is basically randomizing things will hit one of those records and that is the basic reason why the NSEC tree uh, aggressive caching does not work very effective for large uh, zones you have to have many NSEC tree records in your aggressive cache to have a reasonable chance of hitting one of those with a, uh, a single name. So this, this is my last slide. So the summary is, it is you rely on luck to have uh, NSEC tree records uh, 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 being effective. It is. It was a bit of a surprise for me when I uh, uh, learned this, but when I talked to other people, the main reaction was, well, actually, when you think about it, it's not really a surprise. So it's uh, good to have some analysis of this. Um, and uh, you can uh, guess the size of the zone a bit about uh, by using the common prefix so that you 
can predict if a certain uh, NSAC tree record will be uh, have a reasonable chance of being hit so that you can use that to either put it into cache or not. Okay, let's see if there are any questions about this. So, yes, Otto, you've got time for one question, I'm afraid, just the one. Yeah. So, uh, could an attacker try to exhaust the cache uh, by sending large number of uh, uh, records um, or queries? I say, well, uh, if you uh, um, make sure that you only store uh, NSXT records in the cache if they cover a large number of names, then not. But otherwise, yes, you have a lot of ineffective data in your cache, and that's going to hurt you one way or another. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, aggressive caching is, is, is not a reason uh, uh, for to use NSAC3. There are not a lot of reasons to use NSAC3. Uh, opt out is maybe a, a good reason, but uh, there remain very little reasons to use NSAC3 at all. The uh, uh, enumeration thing is al already shown that it's not, uh, that it is uh, e reasonably easy to do, even for NSAC3. So, uh, that's also right. not very compelling. So, uh, Otto, I'm afraid no. I have to cut you off now. No. No. Um, thank you very much no. for taking time to speak with us today, Otto. No. Um, if you'd like to turn off your camera and slides, and I will introduce the next speaker. The next speaker today is Moritz Müller from SIDN, who's giving a talk, Expectation versus Reality, the impact of DNSSEC validation on recursive resolver operations. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Moritz Müller. I work for SIDN, and this research has been carried out together with my colleagues at SIDN and with support from Internet Citizen, where I spent um, a few months uh, last year to, among others, carry out this research. So the main motivation from this research is basically this picture. It shows the number of RIPE Atlas probes that rely on validating resolvers. And what you can see here is that a big chunk of probes still rely on recursive resolvers that do not do uh, DNSSEC validation. This graph might change a bit if you look at other measurements, but in general, it's clear that there's still quite a number of recursive resolvers that have not enabled DNSSEC validation yet. And thereby also the users are not protected. Why is this the case? Uh, well, we, we came up, up with a bunch of hypotheses. Um, one hypothesis was that operators see DNSSEC validation as a burden, so that it um, just takes effort to maintain. Uh, it causes potentially um, calls by clients. And maybe also operators do not see benefits of DNSSEC validation. Of course, you can come up with different hypotheses, but these are the two that we wanted to study in this, uh, this research. And in order to test these hypotheses, we carried out a survey. And we carried out the survey with uh, among 120 operators of recursive resolvers. And we did that by sharing the survey on a bunch of different mailing lists. And of these 120 operators that participated, 87 of them run validating resolvers. Um, and they work for a very large variety of organizations from ISPs, education networks, private corporations, public DNS services, so a quite large variety. And they were located in 32 different countries. Also, they had a quite large varying number of clients from a few hundred up to a, a few million clients. And additionally, we also carried out six interviews that we use for anecdotal evidence. The participants of these interviews were selected based on whether they are running validating resolvers or whether they're running not validating resolvers, whether they are from large providers or small providers, and whether they experience more or less additional workload caused by DNSSEC. The interviews have been carried out anonymously, uh, and uh, there also have some, uh, the interviews, the survey has been carried out anonymously, and there have been 
also, of course, a bunch of limitations with the study. So first of all, we shared this survey on mailing lists. Um, so we have certain self-selection bias, and we assume that people who have strong opinions about DNSSEC, whether positive or negative, are probably more likely to participate in our survey. Also, we try to reach out to people from all over the world, but still we got quite a lot of response from people in Europe and North America, also maybe because our survey was only in English. Also, since the survey has been carried out anonymously, we are of course not sure whether people fill in the survey for the same organization. So we might overrepresent it, have a representation of some organizations, or there might be maybe people that want to influence our results by filling in the survey multiple times, for example. And maybe also potential side note, uh, uh, interesting side note here is that I'm a computer scientist who is trying to do social sciences. So you might want to take the results with a, a grain of salt, but still we believe that we have some interesting findings to share. So the first goal was to understand what is the perceived value of DNSSEC for resolver operators. And in order to understand that, we confronted the participants with a statement and asked them to what extent they agree or disagree with the statement. And the first statement we've confronted them with was, DNSSEC validation is essential for the security of the internet overall, just to get a feeling whether people think that DNSSEC is actually a useful thing or not. And here, I guess there are a bunch of positive things you notice. There are uh, on the validating, people that run validating resolvers, a quite positive response. They think DNSSEC validation is essential, but I think there are also some things that are maybe a bit more surprising. And one thing is that at least for me, that people who do not validate DNSSEC uh, signatures are also quite positive. Almost 60% think that DNSSEC is essential for the security overall to some extent. And maybe another thing that surprises me that even people that validate do not think that DNSSEC is essential, which may become, at least to me, came as a surprise. A second statement, which is kind of in the same line, I would say, is there should be more domain names signed with DNSSEC. And again, we have a quite similar picture where people that do not validate are also in strong favor of more signed domain names and which already might indicate there's still this kind of chicken and egg problem, at least um, a perceived chicken and egg problem uh, on, the, on this side. And again, we have 10%, around 10 20% of people that do not validate, which are uh, strongly disagreeing with the statement. Then we ask a, a bit more specific question, or we provide a bit more specific statement. And here we looked into whether they think that DNSSEC protects against cash poisoning attacks, because this is probably the main motivation at least a few years ago to actually roll out DNSSEC on larger scales, the cash poisoning attacks, and it's still uh, a major motivator um, and a, a threat that people fear. Also, Google talked about that uh, yesterday. So we were wondering whether they think DNSSEC is a useful tool to protect against this. And here we have a quite uh, similar picture where most people agree that DNSSEC is actually efficient against protecting uh, against cash poisoning attacks. But again, there's maybe one thing that is surprising is that even people that do validate think that it is not effective against cash poisoning attacks. And I'm wondering what else might be effective then, if not DNSSEC. And again, we have uh, at the non-validating side, 10% or so that don't think that DNSSEC is as useful. Now, in the past, we have not heard that many public reports about successful cash poisoning attacks in the wild anymore. There have been some papers that still demonstrate that cash poisoning uh, is still possible, but we were wondering whether people actually experience cash poisoning attacks. 
And what you see in this picture is whether people actually think that their resolvers are being targeted by cash poisoning attacks or not. And what I notice here quite early is that there's a quite large number of people that are not sure whether they're being targeted by cash poisoning attacks or not. People that do run validating resolvers in general uh, think that they are being targeted more often. However, we've also talked to two operators that said that they were being targeted by cash poisoning attacks in order to understand whether uh, they know who's being targeted, uh, who's who's targeting them and which domain name might be targeted. But unfortunately, they could not provide us with more information about these attacks. So the story or the, the picture of cash poisoning attacks is still unclear. Now we're wondering whether there might be other factors that could increase DNSSEC validation. Think here, for example, about Dane and aggressive answer cache that was just discussed before that. So here we asked whether Dane provides benefits for the, the clients or for the operators. Overall, the picture is still positive, but not as positive uh, as DNSSEC the, the image of DNSSEC overall, um, which probably doesn't come as a surprise. I guess Dane is not useful for everyone. But still here, even people that do not run validating resolvers think that for some, Dane might be a useful thing. Then we also ask a bit then about aggressive answer caching. And here, quite a lot of people never heard about answer caching. And of the people who have heard about answer caching, and who are not running validating resolvers, 20%, 28% think that they might turn on aggressive answer caching at some point, which also means that they might that they have to validate. But of course, it does not need mean that they also have to enforce DNSSEC validation or uh, DNSSEC uh, bogus failures. So this might be uh, interesting. Um, Then uh, I was just, uh, one thing that I, that I noticed when uh, doing the previous presentation is maybe this picture would have changed if I would have asked uh, whether people are interesting, interested in a technology that reduces uh, load and uh, increases performance. Uh, maybe then the responses would have changed a bit. So, then we were, of course, wondering what is the perceived and experienced operational organization overall of DNSSEC? Because this was one of our hypotheses. We hypothesized that people do not turn on DNSSEC validation because it increases the workload. So then we asked, uh, we, we said that DNSSEC validation increases the workload for resolver operations compared to not validating DNSSEC. So we here focus on people that actually run the, the, the resolvers. And what is maybe a bit surprising is that people that do not validate and people that validate have a quite similar idea about DNSSEC, uh, about the additional over, uh, workload. People that do validate uh, experience overall um, that there is no additional workload, um, but overall the, the picture is quite similar. If we ask by how much the workload increases, then again, we see that a quite large number of operators are not sure by how much the workload increases. But we can also see that people that do not validate have a more negative picture of the additional workload than the people that actually validate and that actually have the experience. If we then move our attention to the help desk, so that might receive a call by clients, when there might be some uh, validation failure and people cannot reach their favorite website, then we can see that the picture is quite different. We see that most people that run validating resolvers do not think that it increases the workload. However, if we look at people that do not validate, then they are way more negative about the potential impact of uh, validation. And this shows that probably the expectation of people that do not validate and the reality is quite different. 
Then we were, of course, also wondering what causes the additional overload. And what probably does not surprise any of you is that misconfigurations and domain names is seen as one of the major reasons why workload might increase. Unfortunately, what we missed to ask is, okay, apparently 64% of people that validate think the domain names, misconfiguration of domain names increase the workload, but what else increases the workload? So we, we are not sure about that yet. One person that we've interviewed said that managing the root trust anchors a few years ago and replacing them uh, caused some workload, but this is of course only a very um, uh, event, a very rare, rare event in general. So there must be some other things that increase the workload. So far, we only looked into, or we only differentiated, differentiated between people that validate and people that do not validate. But we were also wondering whether maybe organizational structures have an influence on whether people perceive or experience additional workload. So what we see here in this table are the different organizations that participated, whether they validate or not, and also whether they have a dedicated team running their recursive resolvers. What we first see is that people that serve more clients in general also more often have a dedicated team of running a recursive resolver. What we, however, do not see is that there is no correlation between having a dedicated team and actually experiencing and actually validating. So you don't, do not need a dedicated team of running a recursive resolver to actually also enable validation. There is, however, a positive correlation between the number of clients and um, whether they experience additional workload. So if you have more clients, there's a higher chance that you also experience additional workload. What we've also seen is that there is um, a correlation between the experience work workload and the time that people run a validating resolver. So if people run a validating resolver for a longer time, then they usually experience less additional workload. Here we also talked with some of the operators about this. And we talked, for example, to one medium-sized operator who did not enable validation, but who was also responsible for the resolver by its own, by, by his own, by, basically. So he was avoiding everything, basically, that would increase the workload. And he thought that the NSSEC validation might be one reason why he might get a call. So he did not dare to turn it on. On the other side, an operator that validated had a team of people running, running the resolver, not on full time, but as one of the, the tasks. And for him, it was um, not a problem to actually uh, validate. So to conclude, overall, the good message is that DNSSEC is perceived as useful by recursive resolver operators in general. DNSSEC validation can increase the workload for some organizations, uh, but by how much it really differs from organization to organization. But what probably is clear is that the quite negative picture of that many people, of, that some people have in the community of DNSSEC validation is probably not true in most cases. What we've also seen, the people who do not validate is that there we have basically two camps. We have the DNSSEC skeptics, which are very negative about DNSSEC, and we have the DNSSEC sympathizers, which still do not validate DNSSEC, but think that DNSSEC is a useful thing anyways. So we, of course, were wondering how can we maybe convince these DNSSEC sympathizers to enable DNSSEC validation? And one thing that we could think of is or hope for are more signed domain names. So if maybe even more uh, .com domain names, and maybe more important dot, uh, domain names are being signed with DNSSEC, then maybe they also see the, the additional uh, benefits of enabling validation. 
One other approach would be to improve DNSSEC signing further to make sure that we do not have uh, DNSSEC validations failures. But I think also here we are in a very good, good track. I think most software, signing software and authoritative name server software is now automating big parts of the DNSSEC, DNSSEC signing automatically. And also, for example, we at LNL, we see constantly a quite low number of um, signing errors. So I think also there we, we are on a very good side. Um, also, we could hope that DNSSEC validation becomes the new default by its own, since many recursive resolvers just enable DNSSEC uh, validation automatically. However, we also ask whether people enable or disable DNSSEC validation consciously, and most operators agreed with that. So just trying to sneak in DNSSEC validation um, from the back might not be uh, not, not uh, worth it or not working. And one thing that two operators actually mentioned was that they were hoping that people uh, would do validation on the client side. And uh, this might, of course, then lift the operators from the perceived or actual burden of running a validating resolver. And um, this could help us to, to increase validation, but maybe then on the other side of the uh, DNS hierarchy. And with that, um, thank you for your attention. I would like to introduce the first speaker um, for the second session. We have TJ Chung from Virginia Tech presenting measuring TTL violation of DNS resolvers at scale. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Hazel. Um, so today's talk is about uh, the title is TTL violation of DNS resolvers in the wild. And my name is TJ Chung from Virginia Tech. I am at uh, CS department as the assistant professor. Um, so the motivation of this study is uh, fairly simple. Uh, TTL, as we know, uh, can play an important role in both DNS security, DNS sec, and performance uh, as well such as um, the TTL has to specify uh, if the DNSSEC response is uh, still uh, is expired and TTL is still valid, we, uh, the DNS resolver has to fetch a new response. And for TLSA records, when the certificate has been, you know, is, is rollover, then the TTL has to be considered for a correct rollover. And for the CDN case, it is a, a responsible for the responsiveness of CDN control domains. The question here is, do DNS resolver uh, respect TTLs? Actually, this is a little bit old question, and there has been a long thread of successful studies that show some resolvers violate TTL. Uh, there are many studies that I uh, showed, uh, showed you here, and each of them has a different data set to answer this question. For example, uh, some of the work uh, may focus on open resolvers, or they may sometimes use a, a campus traffic or uh, routers data set uh, deployed in residential network, et cetera. But still, uh, it is a, a little bit challenging to understand how such TTL violation exists in the wild in encompassing the uh, open resolvers and local resolvers and at scale without gaining a, a spatial access to devices or users in affected in network. So the methodology that I'm going to uh, present today is a, a residential proxy. So it is a, a proxy, but uh, the action node is located in the residential network rather than a, a data center or uh, EC2 machines or something like that. So the, the, the tool name is called a Bright Data. It is a, a HTTPS services that road traffic via residential nodes, which we call uh, action nodes. And this service, is, uh, this service argues that it has more than 72 million IPs around the globe. This is a, a simple diagram uh, that shows how it works. So uh, Bright Data controls three components. Super proxy. So the, when the measurement client sends the HTTP traffic, uh, then it has to first send it to the super proxy so that the super proxy finds the uh, action nodes to forward the traffic. So before uh, forwarding it to a uh, action node, 
the super proxy first checks if this URL is valid or not, if it is not malicious or not, by checking its correctness using their own uh, resolvers. And if it turns out that uh, it is valid, then it forwards to that exit node so that the exit nodes can use its own DNS resolvers and get the answer and fetch the HTTP content from the web server and hand it back to the uh, client. And this green box uh, knows the, uh, the, the solvers that we can control. Of course, uh, we can send, uh, we can control our image of the client and we can run our own DNS authoritative server as well as web servers to measure the action nodes network. Um, there are some features uh, that Bright Data Network provides. Uh, so for example, it only supports HTTP and S traffic and the measurement the client can ask the super proxy, hey, please use DNS um, action nodes, DNS resolver to look up this specific domain name. And also we can specify the country or AS level location of the action nodes. And we can keep using the same client, same action nodes uh, to send a, a multiple traffic to, through the same action nodes. Which, we, which is really useful to measure is uh, DNS resolver because we can pick the same exit nodes over time, you know, hoping that this exit nodes are using the same resolver over time. Um, so our, uh, the talk of the title of the talk is measuring TTL of DNS resolvers. But as I briefly showed you, this bright data, we are only permitted to send HTTPS queries so how can you measure DNS resolvers and their TTL violation? So our initial and very nice plan was uh, like this. So we run two web servers and one is with IP1 and the other one is IP2. We first choose on the action nodes and uh, with the uh, unique identifier, we send a HTTP query and action node will probably use its own DNS resolver and we return the A record that specify the IP1. And after TTL expires, we simply switch it to, uh, to another uh, IP, IP2, and we choose the same exit nodes to uh, send the uh, you know, same uh, request, the same HTTP request, so that the DNS resolver will fetch the new response because TTL is expired uh, from our DNS authoritative, and we, we return a different IP. And if, I'm sorry, uh, if the exit node still uh, uh, goes to the IP number one, it means it's recursive resolver, maybe it's uh, DNS resolver, maybe uh, extending the TTL. That was our naive plan. But the reality is because DNS resolvers in reality is really complex. You know, so many resolvers, so many caching resolvers, front end, back end resolvers. And the challenge is we are only permitted to observe the request coming from the backend uh, DNS resolvers. So we measure the number of DNS queries that coming into our DNS authority resolvers for each unique HTTP request to the exit nodes. And this is the distribution. So as you can tell, one single uh, HTTP query, 50% uh, of them incur about more than five five DNS requests from the five different resolvers. So which means our naive assumption was, you know, blatantly invalid. Um, so we changed um, our plan from this to this. So we now uh, know that there are many back end and front end resolvers out there. And the DNS authority in our control can only measure the back end resolvers. So what we did was, we now introduce multiple uh, up to eight network interfaces to the web server with the different IP. And we uh, manage a, a kind of database to log a, uh, which resolver is coming to our DNS authority server for our query name. But now we, not, we are not returning the same IP address to each resolvers. We return a different IPs to a different resolvers even for the same query, okay? So for example, if we send a, a single HTTP query to the exit nodes, and let's say we, we see from the uh, authoritative server side, if we see three different resolvers are coming to our DNS server, 
then return IP1 to the resolver one, IP2 to the resolver two, and IP3 resolver three. Okay. And we see Exynos you know, coming into the uh, web servers with the uh, interface one, with the IP number one. Then we can guess that, oh, uh, this Exynos may uh, pick the response from the R1. And after TTL expires, now we send the same HTTP request to the Exynos, but we return a different IP address to each different uh, resolvers. For example, IP, IP4 to resolver number one, IP5 resolver two, IP6 resolver three. And if we still see Exynos coming to a, uh, with the IP number one, then we can determine that R1 looks really suspicious, right? Uh, but we never know which, well, whether it is a client uh, actually knows the resolver's uh, you know, uh, behavior or other some client-side network issues. We never know. So we have to pick the same resolver, same actually knows, and do the multiple experiments until we get some certainty about the behavior of the resolvers. So we ran this experiment for multiple days, and uh, we sent about 2 million uh, HTTP queries. And the number of Exynos we tested is over 270,000, uh, which is around, a, uh, <clears throat> which are around 220 countries. So uh, we tested with this, this measurement uh, with five different TTLs. And for each resolver, we calculate the fraction of the Exynos that connect to the old IPs, which means uh, these resolvers uh, may be extending the TTL, right? So the first observation is we find that there is a clear separation between TTL extending resolvers and TTL honoring resolvers. For example, uh, when you set our TTL values to 60 minutes, we find a 92% uh, of the resolvers perfectly honor the TTL, while 14%, I'm sorry, 0.31% uh, resolvers extend TTL. And we find that the number of TTL extended resolvers constantly grows as we decrease the TTL volume. For example, uh, the percentage of TTL extending resolvers increased from 14, 129, 161, 400, 700, 8, 8%, 8 9%, as we decrease the TTL volume from 60, 30, 15, 5 to one minute. And one interesting finding is that a set of TTL extending resolvers that we measure with the higher TTLs is always a subset of what we measure with lower TTL, which means uh, they have this strongly suggests some resolvers use a default minimum TTL value. For example, power DNS, not DNS unbound has a options for this. So these resolvers may apply um, this options. Uh, we also try to cross validate our findings so first one is, well, from the resolvers that we observed, we send a, uh, directly, we send a UDP DNS request to the Alexa nodes to confirm our finding. And unfortunately, we found the uh, perfect uh, consistency between uh, the direct scanning methodology and our residential proxy-based methodology. And we also use another proxy service called ProxyRed, uh, which allows us to send an arbitrarily UDP packet so that we can pick an Alexa nodes and send a DNS request uh, from that exit node. And we only found one uh, inconsistency, inconsistency, but uh, we are not able to figure it out why this happened. Maybe this is because of the timing issue, but yeah, we, we didn't figure it out. But the uh, overall, we find that our methodology is uh, kind of very, is accurate. So this show, this table shows a country level resource of the uh, where uh, Axie nodes uses a uh, TTL extending uh, resolvers. And the top ranked country is Togo and China and Russia. We can find uh, many uh, countries here. And if we sort them uh, based on the ISP level resource, uh, interestingly, we find that many uh, ISPs in Russia and in China uh, seems to extend uh, TTL values. Uh, one of the case of case study of uh, this work is about CDN because it is known that CDN typically uses a short TTLs for performance or security reasons. For example, a pop experiences outage, then short TTL can help them directly, uh, rapidly direct traffic to a different location. 
So the TTL extending resolvers may hurt this responsiveness. So for Tranquil top 1 million domain names, we first crawl their A records. And we note that most CDNs use DNS-based redirection schemes, such as Akamai, to redirect the users to CDN infrastructure using CNAME records. So we manually compile the list of CNAMES patterns for popular CDNs. Of course, our methodology can miss domains that delegate its name servers to CDNs by replacing their NS records. That is our limitation. We could potentially identify them by checking whether both uh, name server and the web server are managed by the same CDN. But uh, we noticed that some companies like Google also provide VPS hosting services, which will cause high uh, first positive. So we decided to focus only on CNN expansion uh, information. So this chart uh, shows the distribution of the TTL values of the domain names with CDN, without CDNs, and 38% of TTLs from the CDN is less than 60 cents. So uh, this is the list of the um, CDNs with their TTLs from the uh, top Alexa one, um, I'm sorry, Franco 1 million uh, domain names A records. Um, so as you can tell, this uh, CDN uses a TTL less than 60. Uh, 60 seconds, which means from based on what we measured previously, 10% of the resolvers, they extend TTL when it's less than 60 seconds, then the CDNs may uh, experience some you know, performance uh, issues because well, if the exit nodes are behind these resolvers. Um, another one is uh, DNSSEC. Um, DNSSEC carries signatures I'm sorry, carries signature, which also carries inception and expiration date, which means basically validity period. So resolvers must evict DNS responses from the cache when the signature is expired, but TTL is not expired yet. So because the validity period is already expired, so the resolver has to fetch a new fresh uh, response from the authority solvers. So our experiment setting is very simple. We set our TTL 60 minutes, but the signature expires in 30 minutes. So after the first request, we sent the uh, uh, second request uh, after the validity period expires, uh, you know, hoping that the resolver contacts to our uh, the our authority solvers and fetching a new response. Um, so uh, this is the uh, research. So we measured a uh, 12,000 ish uh, DNS resolvers, and for a uh, uh, for statistical you know, significance, uh, we filter the re ex resolvers where we only measure the exynodes uh, less than five minutes to use the resolvers, uh, which is uh, 5,000. And we found that 93% of them are DOB enabled, DNSSEC OK bit enabled, which means they seem to support DNSSEC. Yeah. But what we found was only 13% of them actually validate the signatures, which means even if you're returning a uh, incorrect signatures, the Exynos still fa uh, can uh, connect to our HTTP server because they didn't validate the uh, signatures at all. So 93% uh, of resolvers seems to support DNSSEC by adding a, a deal bit uh, enabled in the uh, their DNS request, but only 13% of them validate the DNS response. So with this 13%, uh, we tested whether this resolver extend TTL or just um, fetch, uh, just you know, uh, use the uh, uh, response in the cache. Um, so um, this is the research. So uh, as you can tell, uh, unfortunately, 13% um, of resolvers still serve the expired uh, signature response. So which means they never came to our DNS authority solver. They just returned the response from the cache. And this 13% of 13% uh, uh, fetched the new response from our authority solver. Um, of course, there are uh, some limitations of our study uh, because we can measure a, a multi-layer distributed caching infrastructures, as I showed you earlier. We are only permitted to measure the backend resolvers actually uh, con uh, sending a DNS request to our uh, authority resolvers. Um, 
So we focused only resolvers that we can measure at least five different mixed signals uh, from a, a multiple ASs. Um, so this work will be uh, published a, a, a PAM uh, this year and the data set and the source code and the paper is already available in this URL. Um, all right, uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions. So I want, I see one question from Paul. Uh, were all of the non-compliance to the announced TTL to shorten them or did you find some were lengthened? Um, this is a really good question. So we actually find some evidences that uh, uh, the resolvers that shorten the TTL. Uh, but the thing is, we the uh, we couldn't pinpoint the resolvers that are actually doing so. So what I mean by it is, sometimes we see uh, uh, some resolvers, we see some resolvers that shorten the TTL, but after a couple of days later, when we have a chance to measure the resolvers again, sometimes they show a different behavior. So that was a kind of challenge. It was a bit challenging to me uh, to identify a, a certain behavior of a specific resolvers. So another question is, uh, did you also think about checking if resolvers lower the, oh yeah, it's the um, yeah, same question, I believe, right? Yeah, one week to a lower value. Uh, for this specific scenario, we haven't, I think we didn't test it, but uh, it is absolutely doable. Uh, yeah, thanks for the suggestion. Um, all right, um, I have one question from Victor. Uh, have you notified any operators of validating resolvers about failure? Oh, yeah, this is really nice suggestion. We haven't yet. <laughs> so before the conference started, uh, uh, we'll do it. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, I don't know why we completely forgot about it. All right, thanks, th thank you so much. Uh, in case of Google, I'm sorry. In case of Google, I, I remember one case study of Google. So Google actually returned the sort of fail. So when the TTL is, uh, when the signature is, uh, is a validated period is lower than TTL, then the Google resolvers uh, return the sort of fail response. I think that is a good behavior. So, all right, I think that's it. Right, thank you very much, TJ. Um, if you'd like to um, turn off your camera and slides, I will get ready to introduce the next presenter. Our next presenter is Paul Hoffman from ICANN uh, with public annotations of DNS RFCs. Um, so thank you, Hazel. And so what I wanna talk about today is a project that ICANN launched and finished last year. Um, we've showed some people it now um, before launch, but now that it's been launched, we want to uh, specifically uh, show it again to folks who haven't seen it and ask for input. And this project uh, allows public annotations of RFCs, and of course, since it's ICANN, we specifically care about DNS RFCs. Um, oh my, let's make sure, ah, that does work, good. Okay, so like TJ, I want to start off with the motivation um, for the project. And our motivation has always been uh, for this, that DNS developers and protocol developers, this is different people, people who do software coding and people who also develop uh, protocols, um, they read the RFCs for many different reasons. Um, and then there's a third group that are particularly important to us, which is security researchers. These are folks who often don't have um, uh, the, the same kind of deep knowledge that the developers and protocol developers do about how RFCs were created. They're just looking at the RFC as it stands. So all of these people read RFCs, they read them for different reasons. And um, as they're reading an RFC, they don't really care about really just what are the words on the paper. They wanna know about the protocol, generally these are for protocols, and what it means in the real world. So one of the most, you know, since the DNS is one of the older protocols, um, has, it, has this RFC been updated? And if so, in what way? Were there errors in the RFC? So the, um, for those of you who are, are not familiar with the IETF process, updates happen in new RFCs. Errors might be reported in the errata process. These are two very different things. 
Um, but also, as you're reading an RFC, you might actually, as you know, you come across a certain design choice in a protocol, you go like, oh, that seems weird. How was that, you know, how did that come to be? Without having to look through all of the old, you know, archives and such, you might just want to know, why wasn't this thing that I thought of um, chosen instead? Uh, and specifically for re uh, security researchers, but also for many of us, have there been academic papers written about the protocol, the RFC, whatever? So we wanted to, you know, again, what we're trying to do is to have all this information in front of you when you're reading an RFC. So the way we did it is we took a list of every DNS RFC um, that we could think of and said, let's just do them all. Now, just to be super clear, because some people have gotten a little bit upset about this, this is not some official list of all the DNS-related RFCs. Um, it's what we think. Um, the project actually allows you to add your own RFCs. Um, and some people might say, oh, that's not a DNS-related DNS RFC. Doesn't matter. You don't have to read it. Um, so, But we started from there. And then the other thing that was super important was we did not edit the RFCs. So some people have said, oh, well, when a, an RFC is updated by a later one, you should edit the stuff in the middle. No, no, no. We're really used to the fact that in the IETF, RFCs are never touched. So what we did was we put all of the annotations to the side so that you can read the RFC and then you can see the annotation on the side. I'll show that in, in the coming slide. Um, we started with the simple annotations, such as this RFC is updated by a later one or is obsoleted by a later one. Um, and then the most other, the most important thing we think for this project is not just to say, this is what we think, but we want to let others in the DNS technical community contribute their annotations. Um, <clears throat> this is super important because in fact, for some of, especially like in DNSSEC, there is a great deal of disagreement about does this particular one work the way it should, or was this designed correctly? And so an implementer reading an RFC would get great value out of seeing that, you know, uh, I have to be careful not to pick real names of people in the DNS community, but Alice thinks this and Bob thinks this about why is this feature here. That's useful to an implementer. So we wanted to, you know, do that and make it all as easily extensible as we could. Um, so if all you take away is one URL, that's the URL, that's the project's home. When you go there, you will see a list of the, I think we're at 120 RFCs at this point. Now, that's not to say all of them are heavily commented because many RFCs have been obsoleted by each other. But you'll see a list like this. These are the basic DNS RFCs. We have a sec separate category for um, DNS sec related RFCs, ones that are related to root zone operations, such like that. But this is all of them. And then when you, you see the links on the left, click on the RFC, what you will see is the annotated RFC. So let's say that we had picked RFC 5936, which is about AXFR. This is what you'll see on the screen. The RFC is on the left, unmodified, other than to add the line numbers, but nothing else has been changed in there. All the annotations appear on the right. Um, and so, for example, and the annotations are colored and such like that, you can see that very quickly that this RFC has been updated by RFC 9103. And um, there are comments as well. So I added the comment that many parts of RFC 9103, particularly section six, updates the requirements that are here for TCP. Um, so that is something, you know, that's a set of kind of annotation of saying, how is it updated? And we'll see actually an inline um, update too. Uh, Vicky Risk um, from ISC, thank you, Vicky, um, actually um, submitted a whole bunch of annotations saying which RFCs are implemented by various versions of BIND. This could be useful, especially in RFC, uh, more recent RFCs, um, where people say, well, who's really doing this? If we can get the implementers to say we are, or, uh, you know, this, this sounds a little bit negative, but it's really not. It would be wonderful to have an annotation from an implementer saying, we don't plan to implement this because of this. That's super useful to somebody reading the RFC. 
So again, here are here are the kinds of things that you see at the top uh, annotations at the top of an RFC. It shows everything all updated, and of course, those are live links, so you can go to the other things in the uh, in in the project. Um, it has links to the errata, and again, this is just at the top. You'll see that we also have these things in line in a moment. Um, comments such as that RFC 6014 says that it updates 4035, but it doesn't seem to. So that's a reasonable thing so that somebody reading this doesn't waste their time. Um, and again, there's a comment, of course, uh, 4035 being the third uh, part of DNSSEC um, by nine implements it. So this would be the easy thing if all of the annotations were at the top, um, but more important, we think, are having annotations appear in line. So if you are reading 4035 and you're reading the section on the AD bit, you've been scrolling down, you've been reading, it would be nice to see that this thing that you saw at the top that says that a later RFC updated to actually see it in line. So I wrote as many as I could. Um, other people might disagree with my reading of where these annotations should go. They can contribute their own annotations. That's just fine. Um, so uh, that's how you know you would see that there in the middle of the RFC. Um, and again, it's fine for the same content annotation to appear many times in the RFC. What we're really we're not trying to be definitive. We're not trying to be concise. We're trying to help the reader, and the reader might be an implementer, it might be another you know, protocol developer, or a security researcher. They don't mind seeing more information. So um, before I finish up, this is really why I'm giving the presentation. We want more annotations. Um, we, uh, Wes Hardiker um, contributed a few pointers to academic papers. Um, we would love to see these, like all of the academic papers from the last 10 or 20 years, that mention, um, or or not just mention, but talk about the RFCs to have pointers there. Somebody reading, even an implementer reading, who says, sees something that says, here is an academic paper on this particular topic here, super useful for the reader. Um, implementation notes. Um, we are finding with some of our RFCs in the DNS world that the wording turns out to not be as good as we thought it was. So implementation notes sent, you know, from somebody saying, hey, um, as I was doing this, I realized what this really meant was this by reading the example. Or we just, we had to implement it, try it against a couple and find out certain things. Um, <clears throat> this is a, uh, the third bullet. It's a little bit more dicey, but I still think it's quite useful. Um, some people in our community feel that certain protocols were developed incorrectly or parts of a protocol is. This should have been that. It's perfectly reasonable to have annotations on that. It's also perfectly reasonable for someone reading the RFC to skip over and go like, oh, there goes Paul Hoffman again, commenting on something he doesn't know about. But having annotations with design choices will help in the future when we have to update the DNS spec. Um, as I said earlier, who's implemented certain optional parts, that's really great. And there may be a whole bunch of um, uh, other kinds of annotations that we haven't even thought of. That's just fine. So what I am doing here is I am looking for volunteers to annotate. You can do it at any time. Um, there is full instructions on how to do it. If all you want to do is read the RFCs, great, go to the main one. But I hope as you're reading the RFCs, you go like, hey, I want to say something here, or I wish somebody had said something here about this. And if so, um, it's really easy for you to add annotations and such like that. Um, so that is my last slide, and I am, um, the GitHub page didn't seem to clearly show how to contribute annotations. Um, there is a page off of the main, uh, that was from Victor, there's a page off the main one which says how to do annotations, but basically um, you write up your annotations as little text files, there's a very simple format, um, and you publish them somewhere, GitHub repo, someplace where um, we, uh, you know, can do an R sync or whatever, you tell us that that exists and we do it. So, for example, Vicky, um, 
set up as part of the normal ISC GitHub repo, set up something where the annotations exist. We then pull from there. Um, anytime you want new annotations in, like let's say you're looking at the project itself. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't make this clear. You can either use our view of, of the RFCs or you can clone the whole thing onto your system and keep your own. So you might want to have internal annotations, for example. But either way, once new annotations are available, even if you don't know it, you just give, you just say make, and it pulls in all the new annotations again. Um, so Victor, if you need more on that, I can chat with you. But basically, they're really simple text files. You can look at all the current annotations, see how to do your own. Um, an annotation asks you, well, what RFC are you talking about? What line? And if you don't know what line, you can say line one. So it'll, appear at the top, and then give your comments. Uh, Patrick asks, plan to maybe move, give that to the IETF in the future. Um, so probably not. Um, we would be happy to, except there's a lot of people in the IETF who are like, no, the RFCs never change. You don't get to comment on them. We got some initial feedback uh, from people saying, I don't want to read anyone else's comments in an RFC. And our attitude is, great, fine, don't. Um, this really is aimed at um, the people who want to see things in line as they're reading. Um, and the IETF has a, I mean, look, the IETF has a real hard time with RFCs anyways. For those of you who aren't in the RFC series working group now, um, what is canonical? What's archival? Like, who can touch things? What if you change the spell? You know, like, like these kinds of things take forever. We, look, if the IETF wants this, totally happy to give it to them. We're not going to push it on them at all. Um, Peter Van, oh, Brett, this is super cool and useful. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, uh, um, and and uh, Brett also said, this is great for new people in the DS, DNS industry. One of the things we did uh, was to make it so that it is um, uh, per completely easy to do exactly the same thing for other things as well. So we've heard some interest in the HTTP working group because they have similar issues we do. Um, and some of these are groups that are related to us, like the TLS working group, for those of us who care about dot and doe and such like that. Um, the TLS RFCs are really hard to read, and they have some historical stuff. This could be really useful in there as well. Somebody in the TLS working group who wanted to do this, you know, to create the list like we have of the DNS RFCs and start annotating, it would take less than an hour for them to do. Um, do you import errata as annotations? Uh, we did initially. And then, of course, we can't keep doing that. We, we probably could keep it update. But everything as of last fall was imported and turned into an annotation, hopefully in line. Um, Wes says, there's a lot of ITS members who are unhappy with ICANN publishing additional RFC information and believes ICANN is overstepping. Um, yeah, and there's lots of people in the ITF who are really happy with this. And so, you know, again, we're not forcing anyone to read this. We certainly don't believe that this should be the future of how all RFCs are read. This is for our industry here. Um, uh, people saying no to this, I just want to read the RFC. They can, uh, doesn't replace the RFCs. And quite frankly, that's why we put all the annotations off to the side. Someone can decide, are we doing this a good, you know, as a good job or not? Um, Let's see, um, got a big lag with matter, uh, okay. And I think that's it for questions. Um, let me know if there are any, I, I don't dare touch matter most other than to uh, scroll. So I think that may be it for questions. Hazel, do you agree? I think that, May well be it. I am gonna. I am going to dare trying to refresh it to see if. Um, <laughs> okay. Only one of us should should risk this. Yeah. Apparently, we've had um, some problems with it, and we've been working with the vendor. So. Um, right. I'm just looking to see. Uh, I actually can't remember which of these you've answered. There is one more question. Ah, uh, the license of the content added. Um, uh, so. 
uh, all of our content is CC BY. Um, it would only make sense if you want people to incorporate your annotations to pull them all in. Um, and, um, you know, if, if you're publishing annotations for people to pull, then I think it would be a terrible idea if you put some restrictive license on it. Uh, but it's up to you. Again, we are not controlling this other than in the sense that when someone says to us, hey, I've made a bunch of annotations, we'll put them in the official list if, as long as they look, you know, reasonable. Um, but, uh, and if you have suggestions on how we should be doing it differently, absolutely let us know. Um, we did this with a bunch of, um, you know, ideas of what we want. We ex If we get a lot of readers, we're sure it's going to change over time and we can fix things. We also might change things, is, like I say, if the HDP people or the TLS people pull it in and they say, wow, you should have done this. It's like, great, we can do that as well. Very good. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Paul Hoffman. Coming up next, we have Stéphane Bortsmeyer from AFNIC with Drink, an experimental dynamic authoritative server. So first thing is what is uh, Drink? So as the title says, Drink is a DNS authoritative only server. Um, okay. Now everyone is thinking, but there are a lot of very good authoritative servers. So why do we need one more? Um, the selling point of Drink is to be specialized in dynamic answers, answers that are computed on the fly by the server. Uh, it's anyway, it's mostly an experimental thing. It's uh, don't use it for real serious services. It's it's to have fun and to experiment ideas about the DNS. There is uh, a version which is installed under dyn.bartsmeyer.fr, so you can already uh, try with it. As I said, it's experimental, so please don't try to DDoS it or things like that. So what can you do with it? What sort of answers can you find? Uh, you can have, for instance, the IP address of the client as seen by the authoritative server, a bit like in uh, TJ talk, uh, drink as an authoritative server sees only the last resolver. So IP dot the domain where you installed it and you get the IP address of your client. It accepts A on quad A Q types, but of course you return an answer only if appropriate. So if the request is done over IPv4, A Q type will work on Quad A will elicit no data. On the opposite, if you do the request over IPv6. You have also a TXT queue type, which is more reliable because it works whatever uh, the transport uh, version is. So here is an example with DIG. Uh, as I said, Drink is installed on din.bartsmeyer.fr. So if you request a record, it's a default for DIG, you get here the IP address of the uh, last resolver as was seen by uh, DIG. Now, if you try with the wrong family, uh, you still get the correct answer in the additional section. Here, I query the authoritative name server with the A Q type because that's the default in DIG. Um, but the request was actually done over IPv6, as you can see in the server line at the end. So there was no answer, answer zero, no data, but in the additional section, the IPv6 address of the client. Now, in that example, I query directly the authoritative name server, because if you go through a resolver, most resolvers will drop this extra information in the additional section because they are unexpected. So now probably you think, wow, okay, returning the IP address of the client is not something very original. Many services already do it, but not always with A on quad A, often it's only TXT. Also, many of these services come and go, and I wanted, at least for personal use, I wanted something that was stable for me. 
Um, and also drink as many, many extra because most of these um, services already existing implement only a very limited version of the DNS. Typically, there it is done with a completely custom uh, DNS server. So a lot of things miss and I find them important. For instance, drink implements an SID one. Not a big deal because typically you don't use any cast for it, but more important, it implements cookies. In a Punit talk yesterday, there was a very good talk about the protection against cash poisoning and cookies are an important one and it's not implemented everywhere. Drink as a complete support for cookies. Also for TCP, of course, because uh, TCP is a um, necessary transport for the DNS. It also implements not just TCP, but TCP with pipelining, sending several requests without waiting for an answer on out of order responses. There is a RFC, I don't remember the number right now, but someone will probably put it on Mattermost. Um, there is a RFC that says that if you do a DNS or TCP, you have to support pipelining on out of order responses. Uh, some may say that for an authoritative name server, out of order responses are not too important because uh, typically the response time is known and fixed, but it's not the case for drink because drink generates answers. It can be quite uh, long in some cases. So out of order responses are still useful. And of course, DNSSEC, because why? Well, we had uh, many talks about DNSSEC here. Uh, the main reason why uh, DNSSEC was developed was to create opportunities for topics at uh, ORC meetings. So DNSSEC is really, really important today. So of course the answers are dynamically signed. And let me tell you the truth, implementing DNSSEC is complicated. So here is an example of several requests of a one TCP connection. I didn't find a way to do it with DIG, but KDIG has the option keep open where you can send to a name server several requests. Here you see the hello service, ECS on random that returns something random that you can use with uh, lock Q type or A or quad A. Completely useless, but uh, fun. Among the useful services of uh, drink, I think services that I find useful, you have uh, EDNS uh, client subnet uh, echo, which means that when you query the name, you get to know the ECS that was sent by your resolver. In COE, the resolver should uh, follow. Uh, if, if the client itself sends EDNS client subnet with a slash zero, the resolver should not send ECS, but it's a way to test it and to test if the resolver gives information about you on what sort of information. There are very few services that are doing that currently on the internet. One I know is whoamai.fastly.net with a TXT request. That's cool. You can also get the AS number of the client with the BGP dot the domain name. In that case, you get here at the end, the IP address of the client, the prefix that is announced in BGP and the AS number. This is done by HTTP request to a microservice uh, and it illustrates the ability of drink to not only to do computation or to reflect data that were in the DNS request, but also its ability to query other services. So as soon as there is a, a funny service with an API, with an HTTP API, you can use Drink to talk to it. Uh, and again, this is one good reason why we have out of order replies uh, with TCP, because of course, this HTTP request can take a long time and um, uh, an unpredictable time also. So in that case, the data come from a service using a wipe uh, RIS database. So it reflects what the RIS routers are seeing. Of course, if you want to uh, run a uh, drink yourself, it's free software under the GPL. Uh, it's written in the Elixir programming language because there are name servers written in almost every language, but uh, 
not a lot in uh, Elixir. So it was fun also. Um, Elixir was, is a cool language to write uh, internet servers because of its use of parallelism. So here is a URL to download the code and run it. And if you don't want to download, to compile, etc., there is a Docker image so you can run Botsmeyer slash drink and you have a perfectly working uh, drink server. If you are interested in implementation details, you can see my talk at FOSDEM two weeks ago, uh, where I discussed how it is done, the implementation, the problem, etc. I just want to go back a bit on the claim that we do um, DNSSEC. So here is a good example when we request a bgp.dime.postmail.fr. You get the 80 bit here because everything is signed. As you know, um, generating um, dynamic signatures is not easy. And you, signatures are not the worst part, but you also have to generate NSEC records covering the, um, the reply. And this is much more fun and much more complicated as you have seen in other talks here. And SEC can be really, really, really difficult. So here it is, you have everything. Uh, time for the questions now. I'm going to have a look on Mattermost to see how many questions you have. I should, should really accept request with uh, any query type. So currently we don't accept uh, any query type. We return uh, HINFO uh, like described in RFC something. Um, so because the problem is that it's the IP service is only interesting when you go through a resolver. Because if you talk directly to the authoritative name server, well, you probably know the answer already. So if you go through a resolver, the any query can be intercepted by the resolver that can decide that any requests are refused or things like that. Okay, I think I think that's probably it for questions. Um, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for from this morning's remote session. Um, we're going to be having a break of about ninety minutes, and we will see you back for the resumption of OARC forty for session three. So uh, welcome back from the post-lunch session. Um, lunch was good, so don't fall asleep. Um, I am Pallavi Aras. I am going to be the session chair and the QA uh, monitor for the session. Uh, with me, I have Willem Turup. He will be the timekeeper for this session. Uh, a few reminders, probably you already know this, uh, but Q&A would follow right after the speaker finishes speaking. Uh, you can, for the in-person people, you can pose your questions on the mic or you can put your questions with hashtag questions uh, in the workshops channel. Um, uh, a, another reminder would be uh, the Mattermost poll would be in the workshops channel. Uh, you can give your talk rating on the Mattermost. Um, uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, VeriSign for being the 2023 uh, sponsor. Uh, for the DNSOR conference. Um, so without uh, further, uh, I would like to, uh, I would like to introduce uh, David Rodriguez. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, DNS exfiltration. Okay, cool. Well, it's nice to be here and um, lots of new faces. I'm David and um, I'm from Cisco Umbrella or open DNS, as some like to correct me. And uh, I'll be talking about real-time DNS exfiltration and tunneling techniques and how at Umbrella we're kind of trying to solve that in real time uh, by hacking our caches. So um, this is obviously work from many amazing people, not just me. Uh, for example, Brian in the room, uh, Andrea and Skyler, and of course, uh, a good friend of mine named Scott. So um, if you're not familiar with DNS tunneling and exfiltration, uh, go ahead and Google and you'll find a bunch of open source projects. I played a lot with these myself um, and they're fairly easy to get up and going. There's DNS exfiltrator, which is probably the easiest to go. Iodine, which is pretty common uh, that we'll see in our traffic. DNS cat2 and DNS2 TCP are a couple others that you might want to take out, take a look at. 
So what is DNS exfiltration and tunneling? I'm assuming you probably know, but maybe a really simple example is taking some text, hack, uh, maybe doing something with it, and then maybe performing some DNS queries with it. So here I'm just taking a string such as hello DNS org, uh, and then kind of base encoding that in uh, base 32, and then kind of chopping up that, that resulting string and just sub shoving it in some subdomains. And I have myself a pretty real example of what you would see from one of these tools that I just mentioned. So I added um, the numbers there as a prefix, zero, one, two, three, just so that if I was a name server and I was receiving these queries, which is in, not to be guaranteed in any order, I could reorder them, mash them together, and I'd get that string if I were to decode that base32 encrypted subdomains. So how do recursive resolvers play a role in DNS exfiltration and stopping it or preventing it? And I thought long and hard about this with some people that I mentioned before, and um, one of the first things we thought of is that, well, there's caches in your resolvers, and they're kind of already blocking traffic, but we don't call it that. We say, oh, we're reducing, you know, authoritative upstream queries, or we're serving from local cache so we can make things a lot more efficient. I'm not doing detection algorithms and stuff, but maybe you could. <clears throat> and so then we started looking at different caches, and uh, I have to admit, I didn't really look at a lot of caches when I started this, just our own, but in retrospect, I started looking at other caches from other resolver implementations, and there is no agreement. Um, in bind, you kind of have this kind of uh, structural representation as sort of a tree. You can see what the designers were kind of thinking about, what challenges they were thinking about to try to make things efficient. Not, you have this kind of tri-like structure, that's got this sort of ranked sorted array for our, our, our sets. Uh, core DNS, because it's in Golang, it's a different language, has this concept of essentially a list of maps, or what they call sharded maps. And then DJB DNS, which is the kind of fork of the, um, or what became the result of Umbrella's resolvers, is sort of doubly linked lists, or as Brian always likes to say, sort of like a circular buffer where our, our sets are linked through uh, linked lists. So as we start to think about like kind of like these data structures for these caches and like why are all these different implementations, like you kind of think about, well, what is the little bit of information a resolver gets in a question? You just get the Q name and a Q type and like some other bits of information, but those, are, those two are really guaranteed. And so there's a lot of lookup and of efficiencies that you're trying to thinking about and performance optimizations based on those two and trying to find them. Then you kind of think back to those older structure, the structures I just talked about and what they were probably trying to think about. Um, but then you kind of have these other things with these caches that make them kind of really interesting and alive and dynamic, such as you got TTLs where the, uh, different records are expiring. And then you got different types of blobs of information that are gonna be in those caches. So you, you have the introduction of DNS set keys on top of the RR sets. It's kind of interesting. So, um, so what are these caches doing? They're sort of like this first line of defense in these recursive resolvers. Um, they're kind of trying to stop this kind of traffic that's going to the upstream name servers. But what happens in this flow is that like if it misses in a cache from a question, it's gonna go upstream, but then what's it gonna do in, in the resolver kind of flow, it's gonna then go and update the cache so that the next query actually gets served from that cache. And so then the question to you is, why aren't these caches serving more statistics? Like why isn't that cache just keeping account of like the number of times that something has actually been served from cache or gone upstream? And that's where like you kind of start realizing that as we went back to, go back to the first example of the DNS um, kind of tunneling example of domains that I created where there was a sequence of domains is it's hard to spot DNS tunneling from one given domain. Who knows what that is, right? It just looked like kind of gibberish. But if you see a sequence of them, you start to kind of start to feel like you have a little more confidence. Like, I think there's something here. It might be an encrypted message and yikes if this is actually someone's PII, like I don't know, um, from within someone's network. So kind of talking about this idea of creating caches that are maintaining statistics, let's just call that a tunneling cache, right? The ca tunneling cache is gonna carry these weird statistics and not always just serve like DNS records. 
why don't we just keep introducing more caches? <laughs> Let's explode them in resolvers. Like, if we can maintain the memory footprint um, and the main caches are kind of doing their work, Let's just keep introducing things. So we thought of another idea. Why don't we actually introduce a real-time blockless cache where instead of having this like simple static file of domains in it, let's throw the domains actually in the cache. And what are some benefits of that? One is that we can have multiple algorithms in the background asynchronously updating this blockless cache. So now we're not, stri we're not tied to one cache having one algorithm. We can kind of have a bunch of things going on. The other is that the TTLs can live in different worlds. So our algorithm, our windowing mechanism to identify tunneling domains might be within seconds. But we wanna block for hours. That's kind of confusing <laughs> when you have one cache kind of maintaining records and expiring them, and then another cache like you needed to kind of go at a different cadence. So this kind of alleviated that. Another is just simply the computational load of the tunneling cache and updating stats to the cache is more intensive than just grabbing DNS records. So now we can kind of like tune what goes to the tunneling cache while everything goes to check to see if it's in the RBL cache or the real-time blockless cache. Okay, so what's one of the knobs in stopping things from going to that more computationally intensive cache that's gonna update some of all these statistics behind the scenes? Um, we need to be able to kind of identify character strings that are gibberish. So I'm a natively English speaker, so it's natural for me to kind of think in like terms of like whether or not something is English or not. And one way of doing that is using an n-gram model known as perplexity. So essentially what this model is doing is essentially walking along a string and it's like, it sees the, the, the letter T. And in English, T is very commonly followed by H. You can think of the word the as a good example. And it's not common for the character X to be followed by the character X. So let's say we're now walking along these strings and we go back to that first example, all the base 32 encoded strings. You might see X followed by X. And <laughs> that should shoot up your eyebrows and you're like, wait a second, might be something here that's not like at least human made in th at least the native English language. And so one way of doing that is using perplexity. But the problem with perplexity, and in code review, I got nailed, because <laughs> in the first implementation I did it, um, is multiplication is kind of a no-no um, when you put it into a resolver, because you are now in your CS 101 course, and you realize you're running risks of buffer overflows, especially if you introduce division, which this computation required, at least at its first glance. So one way of dealing with this of course, one of my friends at the time sort of laughed and realized, oh, they do this in gaming all the time, is you pre-compute all those values and you throw them in a lookup table, which surprisingly is actually a really clever idea, but I hadn't thought of it. And then, um, so this is kind of like a simple way of thinking about it, where we were just talking about how we need to look at one character, look at the next. So essentially, I need two bits of information. That's just one row and one column and in this table and I can basically pre-compute all those values, throw it in our, our latest resolver release, and we have some corpus that can identify English-looking words. So one second knob that we need is, seems really easy, is just be able to count things uniquely, which is kind of hard, <laughs> um, at levels of a resolver. So you, you're feeling lots of things, things are unbounded, inevitably, so, um, you know, every assumption you ever make, hey, set size will never get larger than 10 million, yeah, you will see something get larger than 10 million. Um, so one way of being able to do that is predefining a set size. Say you want to only use 8 bits. You only want to use 16 bits. You only want to use 32 bits to store a set of information or something approximately to something that looks like a set. One way of doing that is, for lack of a better word, Brian kind of thought of this is that we call this a fingerprint. You take something like a string, you hash it using your favorite hashing algorithm. Um, in this case, we use murmur hash, and then mod it by the size of your bucket that you're willing to let up. So in this case, maybe it's eight bits, 16 bits, 32 bits. And then just bit shift, one bit, that amount. 
And at the bottom is an example of taking the characters A, B, and C, and then that's what it looks like in binary on the farthest right of the output. And if you now look at that, you can kind of see that A, B, and C are actually all unique, which is not guaranteed with this method, right? Because I'm saying is pigeonhole principle. If I give you nine objects, you're guaranteed that something will hash to the same value, but it's approximate. I just need to know in general, is the query volume to this, let's say register domain, all the subdomains, are they all unique? Or are they essentially all the queries to the same subdomain? And now just like the aha moment here is, if you're really tunneling something and you're really trying to exfiltrate it, why would you query the same subdomain twice in general? Of course, now everyone is going to be doing that, but don't. <laughs> but yeah, you get the idea. Like that's not something you would think immediately out of the box. Okay, so um, the idea here is that our detection algorithm just uses these two things. So you just go through a queue name, you take each label, you check to see if it's perplex. I think this is encrypted message. Um, if it is, now take a fingerprint of that label, meaning it, like it, what bit should it be set to in maybe say eight bits, 10 bit, or 16 bits, or 32, and then just update a cache record related to that. What I mean by updating a cache record is just say, hey, the total number of times we've updated this cache record is just incremented by one, I'm not even thinking about it. The second thing is update the fingerprint by oring it with the existing fingerprint. And so all, and by bitwise oring it, I'm just kind of saying, oh look, like now there looks like there's about three things here, or there's about four. So in general, like we pretty much have the dynamics of like an algorithm that's pretty like ready to go, at least operationally. You have something that can kind of identify um, these counts as they're mod being modified. And you know, you just set now it just set some arbitrary threshold like, hey, if we now saw so many events within so many seconds and they look like they're all unique, throw it to the the real time blockless cache and let it live there for a while. But there's lots of caveats. Um, of course, it sounds like lots of people have tried this and you realize that the minute you um, have tested things in the lab is that in production you will see everything you never thought of. So we have knobs on top of the other knobs I'm talking about. So you'll have allow lists and kind of like things that will kind of tune and kind of tone down the amount of traffic going to the, the tunneling cache. You have those knobs of the thresholds themselves that you'll put in a configuration file, deploy it with your resolver, and you can now modify that without modifying the code base, say, for example. Uh, which is a huge bonus, right? So in real time, customers complaining, you just need to turn off the algorithm, just throw all the thresholds to some arbitrary large values that would never happen. Everyone can go back to sleep, at least until the next 12 a.m. call. The other is that obviously we have a lot of support engineers and people that are dealing with customers right out of the gate. And so we have some mechanisms so that actually our support engineers can query our resolvers and actually see and fake the request of those clients and say, hey, are you being blocked from by our DNS tunneling algorithm right now? Uh, we're really sorry. Here, let me flush the caches. <laughs> um, and then of course, when you uh, have this type of stuff, and this is thanks to amazing people on my team, is that there's tons of monitoring to our releases that tell us about the life, the like, ebb and flow of these caches and things like that, and what is going on in the resolver that gets pushed to the back end. How am I doing on time, sorry. Okay, hopefully no one's asleep. <laughs> um, okay, just a couple more slides and then I'm done. So the operations was kind of alluding to some challenges and kind of working with something like this and implementing something that's a little crazy, a little bit different. Um, another challenge and kind of interesting one that I think is a huge green field for research is that though this is true, you can introduce these caches to all of these implementations of resolvers that I mentioned before, is that you're gonna be left with this. In an actual deployment, you've got like this concept of like almost like split brain, where one resolver will know something that another doesn't. And so many of our, our resolver fleet is obviously behind an any cache address, which is then load balanced, and any one resolver might re detect the tunneling events Another one is not there yet. It's kind of still making up its mind. Um, 
and that's kind of an interesting situation. Thankfully, with this algorithm, like that actually hasn't turned out to be that big of a deal for us. Um, you can actually, we've found that with a lot of testing, you can kind of threshold things at quite an interesting lower bound. But it does introduce interesting questions where some of our teammates have some pretty interesting ideas about how could you make caches more unified? Like, which is like, I think an interesting idea of maybe, I guess not throwing out all the ideas that everyone's thought of, but what I do think of personally is I think of what's happening in machine learning and in some fields known as federated learning, which is like this concept of little bits of um, machines doing their own little thing in their own little corners, but then kind of throwing out that information so that others know and then can update themselves based on that kind of pre-computed values. And um, so it's kind of interesting. One other challenge that you might find yourself kind of, if you start to kind of dive into this, this kind of problem and trying to do it, is um, as at least as I, we've kind of implemented it where we've broken this problem into kind of two caches, you don't wanna be do overworking yourself. So there's a couple ways that you could do that. One is just in constructing these cache keys. You might get really clever with your cache keys, which I think is a good thing. You probably wanna do, the ones that I alluded to are obviously not strong enough to be put in production, but you could imagine what you would do to that. And in doing that, you might incur a little more cost in doing that. But then you need that signature of the cache entry that you're finding in the statistics cache, the tunneling cache, to kind of mirror the one in the RBL cache, right? Because you don't want to misalign each other. And you're not, here's a very simple example. You're gonna, you want to really block a signature of an of a FQDN, like what it looks like because not all subdomains off of the same registered domain are gonna look like that. And so you kinda wanna hone in on like a specific look of a FQDN. Like that looks like tunneling, but that type if off of that same registered domain doesn't really look like tunneling. In fact, it's probably maybe even unrelated. Um, and so you wanna kind of clue like your cache keys into this nature and you need to use that across them. Well, these are just a few things, and that was all I had for today. But thank you for your time, and um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, thank you, David, uh, for the presentation. Uh, we have one question uh, in Mattermost. Uh, the question is from Sam Weiler. Uh, why did you do this work? Is it simply to block IP or DNS mechanisms? To block IP or DNS? I, I, uh, is it simply to block IP over DNS mechanisms? Over DNS mechanisms, I, I don't know. Um, interesting question. I'm, I guess maybe trying to under, I'm not fully sure I understand the question, but I guess what it makes me think of is so we're recursive resolvers, and so um, this mechanism is to block the DNS request before it goes upstream, which would essentially, in, in effect, have exfiltrated data from a network. And so this is at the DNS level with the so, so you are query trying, be dropped. You are trying to block the IP over DNS mechanisms. You're trying to block the IP over DNS? I, IP over DNS, like IADN. Tunneling. Tunneling. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. You're trying to block this. Yes, we're, we're blocking. So why are you choosing to be user hostile? Presumably someone's trying to do this because they want to move data. Sure, sure. Why are you trying to be user hostile? Don't the users matter most? Uh, okay, so one, or that's a good question. Uh, Thanks. One, not trying, I'm not trying to be hostile. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, I think the, the reality here for us is that um, in an enterprise setting, you have to think of our customers. And so the question is, unless they've, they can override the algorithm and say, don't ever block under this, aus like auspice of this registered domain or whatever. But in general, the, when you see the sequence of pattern coming from, you name your fortune, whatever, they might not want this activity going on, no matter what, if it's an employee. 
So, so don't we as engineers have an ethical responsibility to prioritize the users over those operator interests? <laughs> um, yeah, these these are bad guys exploiting data. I don't think you have any responsibility over them. But <laughs> that's yeah, not what I'm yeah, for. So, so. <laughs> not for Akamai, by the way. Yeah. Um, so um, we're doing similar things. The question I have, I mean, a lot of the stuff that is uh, what I call in my talk wanted wonders is kind of like legitimate stuff that mm -hmm. is not exploitation. It's kind of like. Uh, security vendors or, or Google doing something. Um, so um, how often do you actually see something over blocking uh, when, you, when you run this? Right, so FPs, like when we have a customer complain yes. that you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, it's actually very rare. So um, at least to my knowledge, we've been running this in production for I guess a year and a half fully. Um, and um, before that, for about two years, we ran only heuristics. So line by line, we were detecting DNS tunneling without some sort of mechanism that understood a sequence. You used that net for your, for your kind of whitelist to where you not to do that? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, so we had like three years of experience before putting this algorithm in production that we were detecting tunneling events that our customers wanted us to detect. Um, that said, I spent a ton of time gathering as many of these potential false positives where this is actually legitimate tunneling. Um, and there's a lot of hallmarks to that, and a lot of this can be attached, not to give away too much information, but to a name server, right? So like bad guys don't tend to use legitimate name servers a lot. Right, thanks. Yeah. Hi, Manu Meta. I think it's kind of in reaction to Sam's comment. I think we're talking about tunneling here, but it's really any data exfiltration, right? It could be just using fancy labels mm -hmm. to exfiltrate data. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this is just the IP of a DNS case. Gotcha. Uh, maybe can you say it one more time? I wasn't like catching. So using fancy label Doing and fancy talking labels? fancy labels like uh -huh. DNS labels, uh -huh. I could be talking to my authoritative server sure. and, and exfiltrate data this way. Mm -hmm. So if I have access to machine internally mm -hmm. using the recursive resolvers, mm -hmm. I could exfiltrate data to my own authoritative mm -hmm. servers. So your solution should be catching that. Right, right. So we have one more question on the Mattermost channel. Uh, it's uh, what time window do you use to track the unique domains? What time window? Uh, yeah. So. This like start divulging the whole algorithm. No, <laughs> um, no, it's a good question for sure. You know what? Like um, the first thing, and um, we've kind of just I guess like haven't had to inspect this much further is that um, we literally hacked the resolver cache, which has mechanisms in place assuming TTLs of DNS records. That's like a good place to start. So yeah. Okay. Uh, we, we don't have any more questions uh, for David. Uh, thank you, David. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, and now I would like to welcome Peter Spasek from uh, ISC to talk about detecting latency spikes in DNS server. Peter. Welcome to talk about, um, let's say, insufficient imagination, DNS perf, and bits of bind. Uh, we will shortly start with the motivating bug report. Then we go through the tools we used for measuring latency on the authoritative servers, the improvements we did to the DNS perf, ways to visualize the data, and conclude with a couple recommendations if you decide to measure things yourself. First, the bug report which started all this. A user complained that after upgrading bind to version 9.16, the secondary server was mysteriously having latency spikes in the answers. And this is a secondary server, and the worst part was that it 
magically fixed itself after a couple of seconds. This is the worst kind of bug report because we have absolutely no idea what's going on. Couldn't reproduce it in the lab. So we are scratching our heads. How is that even possible? Authoritative server and latency, I mean, this just don't go very well together. Uh, so we started looking for tools to actually test the latency on the authoritative side. And DNSperf does provide latency data, but only at the very end of the test run. So you might be testing for one minute, and at the end of the minute, you get the data that a minimum latency we see, we have seen was this, and maximum was this. That's good enough to detect that there was a at least single packet spike, but it doesn't give us data about how long it was, how many packets was affected, and so on. So that's almost useless. Resperf is a bit better in the respect that it allows us to see the latency over time, but it gives only average. And the average, as the old joke is, well, when Bill Gates enters a bar, everyone becomes a billionaire on average. And for networking, that's kind of similar because we have a couple packets with very high latency and vast majority with low, so that it just gets averaged out. So we were looking for new, newer tools. The Flame Forever provides the latency statistics over time, but again, it's just minimum, average, and maximum with the same problem. It, maybe it was just one packet going crazy somewhere in network buffer, or maybe it was something else, but we cannot tell from the data. DNS shotgun would have been a perfect tool for testing this because it can provide very detailed latency statistics with one millisecond granularity every second, very nice, except that it completely doesn't work for authoritative servers. <laughs> it was specifically designed for resolvers, so if you face a problem with a resolver, go for DNS shotgun. For authoritative server, that's not good. So we are basically left with let's say bare hands, but bare hands can still code in C. So uh, we've coded a new feature for DNSPerf, and it's basically two new options over here. Uh, verbose interval stats will give you statistics during the test before the end, and the uh, latency histogram enables the very detailed tracking for, for latency for individual answers. With these two features enabled, you can get table like this, and the first row, it's basically latency range from 320 microseconds to 327 microseconds, and the number of packets within this latency range was 30 in this test. And it goes on rows just add to each other. Uh, in practice, when you try this, you will notice that the uh, number of rows or, or the ranges uh, change logarithmically, that's done on purpose, so we don't have like millions of lines with single packet in them, but it's aggregating uh, the results in buckets, so the, ever, on average, the precision is, is within 3%, which is good enough for charts. And the reason is that no one is actually going to look at the pages and pages and pages of numbers, because there is no way how to make sense of it. So we have to visualize the data anyway. And that was kind of next problem in line, because the DNS perf doesn't have machinery readable output. It was designed for people looking at it, and of course you can do regular expressions, but then it will explode with the next change in the user interface. Uh, so for specifically for this talk, we've developed a little hack for DNS perf, which is available on these addresses. You can download it. So this is an experimental version of DNSPerf which can produce machine readable output in JSON, and then we modify the scripts over here, which can take this output from DNSPerf and produce charts, which you are going to see on the next slide. Okay, finally, we have our tools. We can get our hands dirty with some measurements. But first, the problem is that we have to make sure that the measurement actually makes sense. Because we were short on hardware, the problem was that no one was sure whether VM is actually good enough for testing latency in a sub-millisecond range. We went for AWS because that's the only thing I can use for VMs. And of course, 
colleagues told me, well, this is insane, it cannot possibly work, but it can. Uh, which kind of surprised me as well, but well. Uh, this is a latency histogram, you have seen that at previous org, so briefly. On the y-axis, we have a latency of the answer from the server. On the x-axis here, we have the percentiles of packets. Basically, the way how to read this is that here, the line at 10th per percentile intersects with 200 microseconds over here, and that says that for 10% of packets, the latency of the answer was 200 microseconds or more, and for the remaining 90% of packets, the latency was 200 microseconds or less. Here, this is the point where most, the, most of the test runs converge or diverge, if you want. And basically, it says that for 99.98% of packets, the latency in this particular test setup was stable across all the runs. Individual lines here are individual test runs, and you see that even though it's crazy VM running on crazy network with crazy other VMs doing other stuff, it's pretty consistent, which is, I would say, impressive. As we go further, there will be more test strands combined in chart, so the, we would basically run out of colors. So we aggregate the runs. So this is the aggregate result across te 10 test strands with the, the line in here is average for 10 test strands, and the blue background is denotes the minimum and maximum values for latency across all the test strands. And obviously, oh, let me go back. Obviously, the question is, this, this clump over here in top left corner, is it some problem where, let's say, at the end of the test, some buffer is you know, being overfilled, so some packets are slower, or is this like clump of packets distributed over time? So to see that, we plot the same test results in a different way. On the x-axis here, we have test time in seconds, and here on the y-axis, we have again latency microseconds, the same scale. And the individual seconds have a single box plot for a single second. Basically, the lower line over here denotes the absolute minimum value in that given second. The line over here at the top is the absolute maximum for a given second. And the little boxes over here in the middle show us 25th, 50th, and 75th percentiles. So we can see that the minimum is all the same all the time, practically. And the, for 75% of packets, the latency is all the same. There are basically no interesting changes. And the maximum, the, which consists of the, like, the blue clump from the previous slide is basically this, the, these little spikes here. But they are nicely distributed across the test, the whole minute, so there is like nothing like overflowing buffer somewhere or hitting some rate limit of sorts or anything like that. So, good. It seems that our test environment is actually working, so we can finally measure something. The test setup. We are circling back to the bug report for bind, and when we drilled down, we found out that the user was having in order of hundreds of thousands of alternative zones, plus a catalog zone. And the catalog, that's basically just a list of zones, and the secondary walks through the list and transfers all of them from the primary. So we've configured the secondary survey bind with, to replicate the configuration the user was using, and then we spent some time tweaking the DNS perf parameters over here. And the most important part is that we were looking at the CPU utilization of the secondary server, and we were tweaking it so the final CPU load during the test was above or around 20%. And the reason is that we didn't want to overload the server. We wanted to see what the latency would be in like normal operating state. Essentially, it's just three VMs talking to each other, nothing special. The important part here is that it's a static configuration. So we start the secondary, wait until it settles down, 
and only then when everything is static and loaded, we start the test. With that in place, we repeat the test for one minute and overlap the results from echo server and the bind secondary to see whether it matches or not. And kind of, it's kind of good feeling to see that actually the authoritative server behaves as you would expect. It just responds almost immediately. The difference on the y-axis is maybe 100 microseconds, maybe 200, but not large difference, and most importantly, it's almost constant difference. So, okay, the server is working. Nice and shiny, over time, it's basically the same. We see that the latency over here at the little boxes is a little bit higher because, well, the NS server does more work than just a co server which shoots the packet back. Uh, and the maximums over here, we can see that it's distributed all the same, so it's just basically seeing the noise from the network, but it's not the server itself. So all nice, authoritative server works, the only catch is that it, do it doesn't explain the bug report. <laughs> uh, so apparently we were missing something. Gradually, uh, we came to conclusion that it has something to do with updating the catalog zone, which was missing in our test setup before. To fix that, we introduced a little script which just waits 25 seconds since beginning the test. Then it deletes a single zone from the catalog, so it's equivalent to removing the zone from the configuration on the secondary side, and then it does nothing until end of the test. So it just, basically in the middle of the test, it removes one zone, that's it, nothing else. With that in place, we repeat the measurement again for one minute, and it just explodes. And here on the x-axis, we see that here the intersection intersection is approximately 1%, so 1% of queries was not being answered within one second, which was like arbitrary chosen value for timeout in a test. So basically 1% of queries was timing out during this test, and the only difference was the script which modified the catalog. So what is going on here? If you look at the distribution of timeouts over time, or general latency over time, we can see that somewhere around the 25th second over here, the script modifies the catalog. And that apparently triggers some problem in bind because then the maximum value goes through the roof. But at the same time, if you look down here at the little boxes, you can see that vast majority of the queries was being answered all the time all the same. The latency didn't budge basically except for the very maximum, for, for the single percent at the top. Which, so what, what is this? What, what's going on? We were scratching our heads for a while, and eventually uh, we realized that there is basically a typo in source code where the hash table size in bits was missing the initial one. Uh, so the hash table degraded to linear list, and during the catalog zone processing for every single member zone. It had to walk through the list, which was super slow and was blocking the CPU. Okay, the fix is simple. Just add zero to the number of bits, recompile, test it again, and it doesn't work really. Um, or kind of, kind of works. It, it's order of magnitude better because the, on the x-axis, we have logarithmic branch or logarithmic scale so apparently it is order of magnitude better, but that's still not what we would expect from the authoritative server. So again, we look at the distribution of the latency over time, and we can see that still it is related to the catalog zone processing. That's not as surprising. But the problem is that, again, we don't know what to do. So developers' heads were exploding for some time, and eventually, we've realized that this is kind of architectural problem in bind. Because historically, there was a single place where the incoming requests were queued, and the worker threads were basically pulling out the requests from the queue. When the worker had time, it took next request to process. The problem is that this is slow. There is a single place of contention. Uh, so to improve the performance, we've move to the model where the kernel is responsible for assigning work to different threads. But the kernel doesn't have the inside knowledge 
which threads are free or not. So the kernel just queues the work and doesn't care whatsoever about the state of the worker. And the problem was, or is still, that sometimes the worker thread in bind can be blocked by a long running operation like catalog zone update, which can take maybe a second if the catalog is large, but that's still too long because the kernel will assign maybe 100,000 packets within one second to the buffer, and then something will either get lost or heavily delayed. So the fix is kind of obvious, re-architect the whole thing. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, 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 I mean, once you get to the bottom of the problem, it's obvious, but if you don't even have the testing tools to see what's going on, it's kind of hard to get a sense of what the problem is and how to fix it. Uh, so in the, one of the future versions of Bind, we will move the catalog zone processing and other long running operations to separate threads which will not be handling the UDP traffic or generally the query traffic. So then the latency will not be a problem until your CPU you know, is maxed out, but then you have other problems. Uh, so with that, we can conclude with a couple of takeaways. If you measure something in networking, not necessarily just authentic server, but basically anything. <laughs> uh, make sure that you always look at the raw data. That was the most important part of this measurement. Look at the raw data, because the average, or even 95th percentile, wouldn't tell us the story. We would, we would see just flat line, okay, everything is nice and shiny, except that users are complaining. Uh, so for the fixed version, or like the intermediate fixed version, even 99 percentile wouldn't be good enough because the like slow down was below single percent numbers of the packets. So that's not good enough. Look at the raw data. Once you get a sense of the distribution of the data, you can you know, do the aggregation you want. Second takeaway is kind of, again, obvious once you realize it, but it took me a while when we are measuring authoritative server, usually the response is within one millisecond. But the typical test tools are set or pre-configured with timeouts in order of seconds. So like three, three, four orders of magnitude longer than the typical response time. And that means that once the timeout is detected, the event which caused the timeout is way in the past. And if you have really busy server and you are correlating logs and the timeout detected, you have to go and basically subtract the timeout period or timeout length from the time when you detect it and go to and see in logs the particular moment where it actually happened. Uh, with that, I think we can conclude with the most important takeaway. Uh, if you're running any so DNS software, please upgrade, don't run obsolete versions, please. Thank you for your time. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Willem Torup to talk from NL Net Labs to talk about RSEC 28 implementation study. Thank you. Can, maybe I can just say next slide, please. Green the green button, yeah. Oh, this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so this uh, talk is about a uh, study that we are doing, and it's, uh, in, uh, we applied to a uh, request for a proposal that was uh, put out uh, by ICANN. And I will tell all about what it precisely is and what it means. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this uh, as part of a consortium of members of from NLNet Labs and SEDN Labs. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, that we are doing this and what it is. So, um, oh yeah, wrong button again. So RSEC uh, 28 is a uh, report with the technical analysis of the naming scheme used for individual root servers. It's a uh, report to the uh, ICON board of directors and the uh, internet community more broadly from the ICON Root Server System Advisory Committee, also known as RSSEC, and uh, also the uh, group of experts 
That helps RSSEC uh, also uh, helped out uh, writing this report. Uh, what does it do? It's why, or why does, has uh, RSSEC written this uh, uh, report? Because one of its responsibilities is to do ongoing threat assessments and risk analysis of the root uh, service system and recommending any necessary audit activity to assess the current status of the root service and the root zone. So um, it's in the report, uh, there are six different naming schemes uh, presented. I will show them later for the root server uh, set. And they are assessed with respect to where the names reside in the D DNS hierarchy, who administers them, uh, how different naming schemes affect DNSSEC validation and the size of priming uh, responses. And there's a nice table uh, in chapter six of the report, which is also linked from the presentation, by the way. Uh, so th these are the uh, actual uh, naming schemes that are reviewed in the report. And so <laughs> I quickly made those slides uh, this morning. So I just noticed that the arrow should be the other way around. But uh, I'm indicating with the balloons what the zones are. So the, the current naming scheme is a till M uh, in the root server zone, which, uh, uh, which is uh, a delegation of uh, the net zone, which is delegated uh, to by uh, the root. And so that's uh, in chapter five of the report. And in uh, chapter 5.2 is the uh, uh, described the naming scheme, which is like the current one, but then signed by DNSSEC. And then the more interesting uh, different ones uh, start. So in 5.3 is a uh, alternative naming scheme where all the letters are just within the root zone instead of uh, two delegations deep and either uh, with a name of a single letter or a single letter dot root service where root service is not a uh, subdomain. Um, 5.4 is uh, root service is a delegation of the root and within that uh, domain, the letters a.m. 5.5 is a separate delegation for each of, each of the uh, root server operators, which is interesting, either as a single letter in the root or as a.root service. And uh, the final one is just one name for all the root servers we just listed uh, all, or referencing all the uh, uh, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. Uh, so chapter seven are the recommendations and the recommendation, the first one is basically uh, keep it as it is, don't change anything right now, but uh, conduct more studies uh, with respect to uh, for, for example, to understand the behavior of uh, resolvers with respect to acceptable response sizes, reduced set of glue records, validating priming queries, and the impact of the search list. And so this is where the request for a proposal comes from. And this is the study that we are now doing. And on top of that, uh, there are also some extra uh, things that were asked for in the request for proposal to do a uh, survey of the root server authoritative uh, server software and to extend a existing uh, resolver te test bed uh, from ICON. And so these are the consortium members. I couldn't find a picture of Yorgos, but a few days ago we had a uh, hackathon day with the consortium and Yorgos is the one who is explaining the current state of the resolver testbed. Uh, so current state is that we have done the survey. Uh, we have extended the ex existing resolver testbed uh, from ICON uh, with uh, automatic deployment using uh, Vagrant and uh, Ansible. Uh, all this work is in a, a fork from the uh, repository from ICON. 
uh, within the NLMS Labs uh, GitHub organization. Uh, besides that, we made it possible to have a private repository. And in this repository, we have all the configuration in which the actual uh, root server operating systems and software are uh, emulated, so to say. And this is where we are now, and we are taking the first steps in doing the actual analysis. And that's it. I just wanted to show you that we're doing this, and you can talk to me about it. So if there are any questions, <laughs> <all right. laughs> For the next presentation, uh, I would like to invite Puneet Sood from Google. Uh, he will be talking about reducing default DSTTL. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm here speaking on behalf of Victor Dukovny, who, who came up with the technical details. But the idea is very simple, uh, to help recover from bad pushes of DNSSEC data to TLDs, it would be great if the TTLs on the DS records could be shorter. And this really go, expands on that main point. Uh, just for any other large system on the internet which people depend on, we want to be able to roll back broken changes fast. And if we want people to use DNSSEC for critical domains, then there is a clear need for having the ability to roll back those changes fast. And in DNS, everything's caching and TTLs. Therefore, it means that we want to be able to roll back broken DS records fast. Why DS is important and we are not talking about the other ones? because the DNS key and the RRs within the zone, that's, those are mostly within the control of the zone operator, so they are able to make those changes or set TTLs as they say fit. However, the DS record goes into the parent zone, which follows a long chain of uh, actions from the domain operator all the way to the TLD. Therefore, the TTL here matters. Uh, the current state of TTLs on, uh, for DS records across TLDs is that most of them currently have a 24-hour value. And if you push a change which is broken and has a 24-hour TTL, it's going to, even if you roll out a fix in five minutes, it's going to take 23 hours and 55 minutes for the fix to propagate to all resolvers, theoretically. Uh, yeah. So that's the motivating reason uh, for talking about this. Uh, the main point to note here is because uh, DNSSEC validation follows a chain, just because the DSTTL has been reduced doesn't mean it's going to result in a ton of extra queries to the parent zone because the child zone where most of the interesting RRs live will be validated against the DNS key. And as long as the resolver has the DNS key in cache, it can validate the RR SIGs for the zone RR sets without having to relook up the DS often. Yeah. And I just added the last line to say this is not just us thinking about this. Uh, Shumon in his presentation yesterday also talked about a similar topic. Okay. All right. I think we have less time. I'll see. I'll go quickly through this. Uh, this outlines the basic idea that, uh, yes, what I said earlier, the DNS key RR set will be cached per the TTL calculation for the DNS key and the RR seg, and then the DS record doesn't need to be cached all long, as long as the DNS key is valid. And uh, one point to mention is if you want to be able to switch a zone from being signed to unsigned, that's the case where you also have to reduce the DNS key TTL, not just the DS TTL. However, the DNS key TTL is in the hands of the operator of the zone, so they can manage that. But it's a de important detail. Uh, yeah, and once you have this, then hopefully more people can do DS. Okay. 
This is just a survey of the DSTTL values advertised by the top 50 TLDs in the world by query volume as seen in Google Public DNS. And it's basically, you can see that a majority of the TLDs in the top 50 have set a one-hour TTL, which is already good. Uh, but there are a few outliers which are at a day or longer. All right. And then on the other end, there's an example of the .au TLD, which has set a 15-minute DSTTL, has a growing DS, DNS sec adoption. Seems to be okay. Uh, we haven't done detailed analysis yet. I'm sure people will ask about that. That's something we plan to do. We haven't done that yet, so no real numbers to share yet, but we'll, we'll do that. And the, I think the ask in this room to various operators is, can we work with lower TTLs for DS records? Thank you. I have, uh, my name is Brian Summers from um, OpenDNS Umbrella Cisco. Um, two observations, um, our resolvers will trim TTLs of security records according to their parents. So if you reduce the DS record TTL, then the DNS keys underneath that and all of the RR SIGs will suffer the same fate. Okay. Um, and this is necessary so that if a DS record does time out, we do the correct validation at that point. Um, and the second point is that um, when you get a DS record as kind of glue from a delegation, so you get an NS uh, uh, referral and you get proof or negative proof with that delegation and that negative pro proof has no TTL. So there's a bunch of NSEC records or NSEC3 records that will have a TTL according to the zones minimum, which hopefully will reflect the SOA record, but there's no SOA record with that stuff either. So we cache that using the NSEC or NSEC3 TTLs. So with this scheme, there's no way for, uh, there's no way to go from negative to positive. Uh, so the non-existence of a DS record to the existence of a DS record and control the TTL. Right. Okay, so uh, thanks for your questions. I think you asked two things. The first one is the lifetime of the DS record automatically puts a ceiling on the lifetime of the RRs in the child zone. We talked about it, I think uh, Victor can chime in, uh, but his read of the specifications is that that's not necessarily true. You don't have to enforce it. But of course, if what's happening in the real world is that people are enforcing that, then we do need to consider that angle. To the second question, I would claim it's okay going from unsigned to signed because from the beginning of time till now, you've been unsigned. Waiting an hour longer to start getting, showing up as signed and validating resolver is not a big deal. It's really, oops, I made a mistake. I need to undo that so people can reach my website is the uh, bigger concern. Thanks. Suzanne Wolf, PIR. Um, I can say that uh, we've been looking at this, have been in a couple conversations about it, like the idea, can see the purpose, can see the use case. Um, there is a couple of things, as everybody knows, involved with turning on something new and exciting in production. And one of the things we're looking at here is that basically being able to manipulate TTLs is kind of a new knob. And one of the things we have to look at is um, EPP. So if anybody wants to make that useful, We'll see what we can do. Sure. I think I heard you mention EPPV. I'm not sure. Though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it was discussed earlier. Uh, I don't have good visibility into how that process is working right now. But if, if there is enough there's, enthusiasm and likelihood that will be adopted and implemented, sure. Yeah. If, if there's a draft, that's the first step, and we'll see what we can do with it. Warren. Okay. So Warren Kamari, Google. So yeah, I think some of it is getting an EPP extension is a lot of faff and work. And I think it's more 
are registries actually interested and willing to support it? And if it seems like yes, then it's worth going through all the faff and work of writing the document. Right. If not, then... Yeah, if, G if GTLD operators want to make this work, part of what has to be done is the EPP extension. Oh, I would like to... Oh, sure, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so Victor, uh, Victor would like to, it's a question, comment, correction. Uh, for one of the slides, I think, uh, which says the top 50 count that you had shown. I have no control. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so for one of the slides about the top 50, uh, what Victor is saying is note top 50 by count of DNSSEC delegation, not query volume. Hey, hey, Puneet, this is uh, Shuman. So I just wanted to make a comment on um, uh, Suzanne's uh, statement about needing another configuration knob and it will probably have to be EPP. So it turns out there is a draft out there. It was, there was proposed an EPP TTL extension quite a long time ago. This was by Gavin Brown. There wasn't any interest at that time, but he has recently revived it based on comments he's received. Hmm? Yeah, so, uh, it might take off again, and I think there is more interest in it now than there was previously. Uh, thanks, Shimon. So thanks for the reminder. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have put one or two lines about that. So Victor's been following up with Gavin there. Yeah. I think my uh, take on this is we should implement the simplest approach which works and will get adoption. So if it's EPP and we can make it happen, sure. But if it's like EPP is not going to happen because it's not going to get adopted, even if a standard's written, then we should look at other ways to make it happen. Uh, yeah, sure. And the simplest, there may not be a single simplest approach, right? For, yeah. for some TLDs, EPP will be the simplest or the only viable approach, but not all TLDs use EPP, right? So you probably realistically are going to have to pursue multiple things. Agreed, yeah. Meaning it, everyone doesn't have to make the exact same choices. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Puneet, for the presentation. Uh, next, I would like to welcome Joao Demas for a presentation about a quick look at DNS centrality. Thank you. Um, basically, as, as a way of introduction, uh, some time ago we got uh, thinking and asked about what did uh, what sort of level of concentration was there on internet services on dns services on the internet <clears throat> because some people were worried that some players were having too much of a role too, too big of a role so we started looking at these <coughs> there are two sets of data that i'm going to uh, go over here one is in steady state you can look at the outcome uh, every day uh, in our uh, website and there is one that we have just starting to to look at okay um, so that's what I said to get them time. <coughs> the first thing that one should decide what to do about uh, when talking about centralization is actually go and find out what is the definition of centralization. I'm not going to spend any time doing that right now, but in the blog that has a, a, a URL at the end of the presentation, there's some discussion about different definitions of what different market regulators consider to be concentration or not. Um, I'm more, more, more interested in the technical data, actually. So the DNS has two parts, and these two services, these type of services, are not necessarily operated by the same organization, so we look at them separately. The recursive, which, as I said before, is the one that's in the sort of steady state, has been, uh, we have been generating reports and graphs for quite a few time, and uh, the authority, which is the new one. In the measuring of the resolver usage, what we are doing is we are using the Google Ads based um, measurement platform that we have talked about in the past. And this is currently generating uh, about 10 to 20 million ads a day and they spread them. They do a pretty good job of spreading them uh, around the world more or less evenly according to uh, internet population in each country. Um, so each of these ads um, basically downloads a little bit of JavaScript to the end device, uh, which comes, contacts one of our servers and downloads a series of tests that the client then has to perform, which basically are URL fetches but use unique names. And then we watch our logs to see who fetched what, when, and so on. Um, in gathering the information about the resolvers, uh, we have some tests that uh, are normal DNS, 
uh, just using a unique name and we see what comes in. And then we have a, a different name server that always um, replies server fail, no matter what you ask of it. And what this does is basically shakes the, the end device to go through the list of configured uh, resolvers that it has, walk, walk through the um, uh, resolve.conf basically, or whatever equivalent. So in that way we get uh, different types of information. Um, what do the results look like? And uh, the URL there will allow you to go see uh, the different uh, views we can have of the data we obtain. Uh, basically, the short answer is that resolver markets don't seem to be concentrated. About 60 to 65% of people use the resolvers that their ISP tells them to use. So it's uh, uh, resolvers that are operated by the same AS number where the user is residing. And then there is a, a number of open uh, resolvers that also get used. Uh, the largest of which is, is Google, but it's, it's a much lower percentage. Um, there are three ways to look at this. Um, the graph that I'm showing right now, as is indicated in the, uh, in the text in the left uh, little block, shows of all the ser servers uh, that the, the, the client has configured, which one does it use first? Okay. The alternative views are uh, list me all the resolvers, which uh, basically adds, has the property that it adds to bigger than 100%, as one would expect. But if the, it, it is answers a different kind of question. Many people have um, more than one resolver, uh, usually operated by the ISP, but some ISPs, um, for instance, use Google DNS as their backup in case they screw up, that their customers keep on going. So those are the different options. So basically, the bottom line is resolver market looks uh, quite OK, actually. For the authoritative DNS view, we have to use a completely different way of looking at things. Uh, but thanks to an agreement we have uh, with Cloudflare, where we um, let them operate their uh, resolver in the one, 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 uh, address, which is uh, an APNIAC address, in exchange for us to have access to some uh, <coughs> data for research purposes. So basically, it's, it's structured as a joint research effort. And we, get a, we are now getting a stream of the queries that arrive at their different endpoints for the 1.1 uh, the quad one service. Uh, we try to get as little data as possible from them. So in this point, uh, we are only getting domain names that the queries that arrive. And domain name is a kind of a generous way of defining what they get because um, people throw any sort of stuff at these uh, servers. It's amazing. Um, uh, JavaScript, SQL queries, anything goes. Um, I will explicitly ask them not to send us um, any user data, any IP addresses, any times, anything. So we don't want to have uh, any sort of concerns about uh, privacy of the users. We go through the list, discard invalid queries, which are quite a lot. And then what we do is in the second step, for each of these names, we go and fetch the list of name servers that are listing the delegation for the zone and we sum, add all, uh, everything up and look at the results. So as this is preliminary, it's done with a single, uh, the date of a single day, uh, sometime in September 2022. And what we saw is basically there were servers, DNS authority servers, hosted by 27,000 unique AS out of the net, in the network. This is out of a total of 75,000 ASs out there, uh, approximately, so about one third. Um, however, the top 50 ASNs or networks um, seem to take care of about 90% of the query volume to authoritative servers. Um, as I said before, we are trying to automate the whole process, but later our systems seem to be fighting us, um, so it's not done yet. Um, this is the graph of cumulative queries against number of networks, and this actually does point to quite a level of concentration, unlike the recursive. So we'll look more in depth at this. Um, also because there are two different, at least two different ways of looking at it. It's volume query and number of hosted domains. Those two don't necessarily have to match, right? And they indicate different properties. Um, the preliminary table is there. It's also on a, a blog post that Jeff uh, published. 
Um, it has some errors because it was a one-off run. For instance, number nine, not available in the next domain, clearly shouldn't be there. But it gives you an idea. Um, Amazon, with all the things they host, um, has a, a lot of domains hosted at their, at their systems, and uh, it takes a lot of queries, right? So kind of what you see there, if you can read that table, and sorry for the, for the page, when I looked at it on the laptop, it looked okay. <laughs> Uh, is more or less what you'd expect, uh, but perhaps with a, a higher than expected level of concentration. So you can get a, a better view of these, a more continued view of these. The resolver data is all there. The authoritative will come along, and the first publication we did was the blog at APNIC that I mentioned. So that's it for now. Expect to have more reliable and continuous data in the next work. That's it. Anyone? Okay. Eric Zegas, Domain Tools. Um, on the first graph that you showed with the um, resolvers, I noticed yeah. that there was a big change around January 1st. Oh, yeah, this that one. one. Yeah. Is, is there any comment about <coughs> anything that might correlate with that change? It's actually not January. Um, it's somewhere in um, late, late 2022. I don't remember exactly. Uh, I don't think it's a measurement artifact. Some of the spikes there are measurements artifacts. This, our system seem to have the property that as soon as I walk out the door to take a few days out, they explode. Um, so those are the li 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 small peaks. But th that shift is not, uh, is not, uh, is not a, an artifact. It's actually something measured. But I can't remember right now what it was. There was something that uh, changed at that time. OK, thank you. So at this time, uh, thank you, Joao. And uh, I, I would like to thank all of the presenters uh, who are here today. Uh, without you, there is no conference. So a round of applause for the presenters. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank uh, all the program committee members for selecting or working on the talks and doing the session keeping, doing all the timekeeping. Uh, it's great. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, a reminder to everybody about the free COVID tests and masks that you can pick up at the registration desk. Um, that's it. Thank I'll hand over to Keith. Thank you, Pallavi, for your excellent job, as usual, of uh, cat herding the, uh, the PC and the speakers, and uh, I'm, well, it's another great program. So it's that point where we got to end of a workshop again. Um, it's been great to see 75 people in the room and another 75 online. Um, I have a few closing remarks. I know it's Friday afternoon, and some of you want to get home, and some of you want to uh, get to the end of a long week, so I will keep it short. Um, so, um, hopefully you noticed this already, but we're in the Mastodon world now. Um, so, over the course of the past couple of days, we have just opened up ORCS Mastodon, MastodDNS instance, um, to provide you all with federated social media. Um, at the moment, that's open to work members, um, but once we have um, checked out how it's all working, we plan to open it to the wider DNS community, just like our Mattermost server and our, um, our, our mailman lists are. So if you haven't tried it or signed up yet, by all means do so. Um, the mammoth will be after you. Um, and, um, and yeah, thanks for everybody who's already uh, contributed content to that. So ORC events, um, last year we did three hybrid workshops. Hybrid workshops are more work than online workshops or, or in-person workshops. So that proved quite demanding last year and it was, it was getting in the way of some of the other priorities that we have at ORC. So for this year, we decided we will do two workshops and then um, see how that goes and what we will do next year. Uh, we are doing a couple of other things this year, though. Um, a bit more detail in a minute about a DNS-themed hackathon, which we're um, supporting in, in partnership with other organizations just before the next right meeting in, in Rotterdam. And then probably what we will do with the AGM is have that standalone, um, probably online, um, like we've done for the last couple of years. So, um, I mentioned the um, hackathon. 
Um, we're partnering with NetNod and the RIPE NCC on this. We've also got a number of sponsors, SIDN and LNET Labs ISC. Um, we're looking for more sponsors. Um, so if you're interested, talk to Jerry. Um, and um, more info will be coming at the end of next week. But that, that's the, the Saturday, Sunday before the, uh, the right meeting in, in Rotterdam. Um, in terms of what future workshops, um, this is not confirmed yet, um, but you may recall we used to partner or work workshops with ICANN's Domain Symposium, and um, ICANN gives us a lot of resource support for that, which means that we can go to parts of the world that would otherwise be a bit of a, a stretch on our own. Um, so we have agreement in principle from ICANN and Viennic, the local hosts, um, to do this in Vietnam in the first week of September. Um, so you might want to stick that all in your travel budget. Um, we still need to confirm a whole bunch of logistic details, contracts with venues and all the rest of it. So it's provisional until then. Um, but that, that, that is currently the plan. We're quite excited about being able to do that. And then in a year's time, um, we will be um, collocating with Nanog again. Again, that's subject to venue contracts. It, it will probably be um, in a um, US state, not too far from here. Um, Dinesh is off to do a site visit to, to, to verify that. And you know, the workshops, um, there's all kinds of ways in which you can support them. If you can sponsor them or um, be a patron for a year or give a donation, um, that, that helps us run the workshops on a, an effective basis. Um, and then you know, the final thing is just to thank everybody. Um, you know, these workshops wouldn't happen without the ongoing support of ORC members and supporters. So thank you all for your, your solid continuing support that keeps ORC sustainable and, and relevant. A uh, particular thanks um, as ever to VeriSign, who are our workshop patron for this year. Um, a whole bunch of people um, on site who have, who have helped um, make things work. Um, you know, it's been always great to work with the Nanorg team um, and um, their venue partners, Hamilton. Um, also, the, uh, the guys at Clarity have done another great job um, for um, supporting the AV and also uh, line speed for the network. Um, again, the program committee, they've done a lot of work, not just in terms of the content, but also in terms of meeting logistics. Um, and, um, and yeah, the hotel's been great as well, so a big, a big thank you to the hotel staff. Um, I think, uh, you know, another important thing is that um, these events are a team effort. Um, it's not just about the work staff, it's not just about the program committee and the speakers, it's about um, everybody working together. I've had to spend a few weeks away um, from, from doing work stuff in recent um, months and it's in, in the past month and it's just been really great to see how the work staff, um, including all the new people that we've been able to hire over the course of the past year, have just been working together really well and, uh, and making that happen. So it's, it's a great community and it's a great team within that. And, and finally, um, to, um, to thank our, our speakers, um, all of whom come here on their own time and account, and also a special thank you to Hazel from the Programme Committee um, for running the online social last night, and also for um, her completely unflappable efforts in terms of running this morning session, despite the various um, things that we had go sideways on us. So, um, so yeah, um, you know, if you just um, please join me in thanking everybody for, um, for their efforts. <laughs> A uh, few, few final details, um, your badges and your lanyards, please take them away with you. Um, you know, we live in an age where we need to be careful about um, what our bodies put out, so um, please don't leave them um, at the registration desk or for the hotel staff to clean up. Please, please take these with you. Um, and, and yeah, I think, I think that's it. Um, the only final thing is um, thank you all for the feedback on the talks and for general feedback on the event, um, please fill in the survey and uh, look forward to, uh, to seeing you next time. <laughs>